All About by Michael Caine. I first started to act at the age of three. We were a very poor family, and it was my mother's idea to have me help out with her many outstanding bills. She wrote the script and directed the action. The cue to begin my performance was a ring at the doorbell. Grasping my small hand, my mother rushed down the three flights of stairs from our small flat and hid behind the front door as I opened it. The unsuspecting third member of the cast, the rent collector, was standing there as I delivered my first line. Mummy's out, I said, and slammed the door in his face. I was born in the charity wing of St. Olive's Hospital, Rotherhithe, on Tuesday, March the 14th, 1933, at a few minutes after 10 o'clock in the morning. I weighed 8 pounds, 2 ounces, and my mother later told me that the birth was easy. The last easy thing I was going to do for the next 30 years. I was born with a mild, non-contagious but incurable eye disease called blephora, which makes the eyelids swell. Like many things in my life, this problem turned out to be actually in my favour as by the time I was a young actor, my heavy eyelids gave me a rather sleepy and, more importantly, sexy look. Apart from my eyes being a bit dodgy, I'm told I also had ears that stuck out at almost right angles from my head. This time the deformity was curable, with the aid of sticking plaster, which my mother used to pin them back every time I went to sleep for the first two years of my life. The flattening of my ears was a two-edged sword, because they are now so flat against my head that sounds often whiz past without hitting them at all, which makes me slightly hard of hearing without actually being deaf. Dodgy eyes and prominent ears, what else? Well, I was born with a vitamin deficiency known as rickets, which meant, when I eventually started walking, that my ankle bones were not strong enough to support even my meagre weight, and I had to wear surgical boots to keep me upright. I also developed an involuntary nervous tick in my face, which was called rather frivolously St. Vita's Dance. Not a very promising start for a future actor. I sometimes have this vision of myself walking down the street as a small boy with heavy-lidded, staring eyes, a nervous tick, ears pinned back with plaster, and wearing Frankenstein boots laced up to just below the knees. I must have frightened the shit out of the other kids. I was named Maurice Joseph after my father, who was 36 at the time of my birth. He had returned from seven years' service in India with the Royal Horse Artillery to marry my mother and participate in my conception. A tough man with jet black hair and a strong hawk-like nose. He was only about five feet eight inches high, but he was very thick-set, extremely intelligent and completely uneducated. Like most of his class at that time, he was conditioned to do only manual labour. For a couple of hundred years, the Micklewives, that was our surname, had been porters in London's Billingsgate fish market. So even though he was one of the three million unemployed at the time of my birth, at least he knew what job he was out of. My mother was an absolutely traditional working-class mum. She was short, plump, rosy and cheerful. Very funny and as tough as nails. Her whole life was devoted to her home, her husband and her children. And on top of this, she worked all her life as a child lady. She was completely devoted to my brother and me all her life, and I can't remember her buying anything for herself that was not second-hand. The first new coat I ever saw her wear was one I bought her when she was 56 years old. My arrival brought about a move from my parents' one-room to a two-room flat in Irwin Street in Camberwell. Number 14 was a tall Victorian terraced house, which had seen better days and was now converted into small flats. Our flat was at the top, three long flights of stairs up from the ground floor and five flights from the garden where the only toilet for five families was situated. The location of this toilet was to take on major significance as my weak legs meant that five flights of stairs were a tremendous obstacle for me. But as I grew and ran up and down these stairs my rickets eventually faded away and I developed very strong muscles plus a facility to control my bowels which has come in handy many times since when filming in exotic locations. When I was about two and a half years old, my mother disappeared and I was sent to stay with my Aunt Lil. When my mother came back, I had a new baby brother called Stanley Victor, who had been, I was told, found under a gooseberry bush. This sounded perfectly reasonable to me and I accepted it and my new brother immediately, although I was a bit put out when my bed was shoved into the corner of the bedroom and he was placed closer to my mother. 
At the age of about four, I began school at the John Ruskin Infant School in John Ruskin Street. I was a very pretty little boy with blonde curly hair and big blue eyes, and my teacher mistakenly christened me Bubbles, which had the obvious effect on the other boys. After two or three days as a walking punch bag, I informed my mother that I was not going to be going to school again, and she very quickly realised what was going on. One morning she paid an uninvited visit to the school during our play break and asked me to point out the boys who had hit me. This I did, and much to my surprise, she beat the shit out of all of them. I always knew she was tough, but that surprised me. My father, on the other hand, took the view that if anybody hit me, I should hit back, even if it meant getting pounded. There is no shame in losing a fight, he told me. There is only shame in being a coward and refusing to fight. When I told him that I did not know how to fight, he said with a twinkle in his eye, I know, and I'm going to teach you how. With that, he got down on his knees in front of me, put his fists up and said, Hit me. And after a bit of persuasion, I did. Pretty soon, I had no more trouble at school and was renamed by common consent, Snake Eyes, which was a source of great pride to me. I once asked my father what I should do if someone picked on me who I couldn't beat in a fight. Easy, he said. You bide your time, wait until he's not expecting anything, and then you get a bottle and smash him over the fucking head with it. It's very important, he went on, that you never let anybody get away with an attack on you, or you will become a target instead of a man. And although I hate violence of any kind, I have never forgotten this. When I was nearing six years old, the atmosphere in our flat began to change. My mother and father and friends and relations who came to visit us were somehow not as cheerful as usual, and sometimes they were downright miserable, especially when they listened to the wireless. It was 1939. When the Germans began the blitz in earnest, men came to build an air raid shelter in the garden of our flats. This consisted of a six-foot deep hole dug in the ground and covered with sheets of thick corrugated iron which were in turn covered with a couple of feet of earth. They wouldn't save anyone from a direct hit, but they were protection from shrapnel and incendiary bombs. Despite the bombing, we went to a school for children who had not been sent away from London. A strange phenomenon developed when Hitler started the daylight raids. The teachers told us that if the sirens sounded as we were on our way to school and we were closer to school, we should run there. But if we were closer to home, we should run back. So at nine o'clock every school morning, you would find groups of kids standing on the corner, just out of sight of the school, praying for the siren to go, so that they could run back home for a day off. My father was called up to serve in the Royal Artillery, and we left London with my mother to go to Norfolk, on the east coast of England. Its main distinction is its flatness, made very famous in Noel Coward's play Private Lives, when the hero asks his ex-wife where her new husband comes from, and she says, Norfolk. Noel's reply is just, very flat, Norfolk. So there you have it from the master. We were housed in a large, disused farmhouse, which had been refurbished to the standard to which country people expected we slum dwellers from London were accustomed, which meant that it was very primitive indeed. However, it was an idyllic place for a scrawny little city boy. Although I had long ago lost my surgical boots, I was still not strong. Here was a chance to run free in fresh air, away from the soot-laden fumes of London, and get the sun on my face, instead of the shade of dark buildings. For children like myself, the war was lucky. We were taken out of our rotten environment, and given a chance for a healthy life. There were no chemical fertilizers put on the food we ate, and so we were forced to eat organic food for five years. Rationing meant that butter, cream, and even milk were rationed, so that there was no chance of high cholesterol. Meat was restricted too, so we ate a lot of chicken and fish, and sweets and biscuits and anything made with sugar was almost unavailable. The government gave all the children free orange juice, cod liver oil, malt and vitamins to supplement food shortages, and so they were actually giving us forms of nutrition that we would never have had in our diet if there had been no war. After we had been in Norfolk for about six months, my father came home on leave for a fortnight. We could not wait for him to tell us all the great adventures that he had had fighting the Germans, but we were very disappointed when he finally arrived. He didn't seem like the dad that we remembered, 
and looked very tired and sometimes very sad. He slept, it seemed to me, for the first week, but he eventually brightened up and took us into King's Lynn, the local town, to go to the pictures. When I asked him where he had just come from, he said that it was a place in France called Dunkirk. I realise now, of course, what he had just been through, but at the time I thought he probably didn't like the country. When my father's leave was up, he was sent to North Africa to join the 8th Army. We didn't know it then, but we weren't to see him again for four years. The small elementary school that I went to during this time was run by a formidable-looking lady who eventually became a close friend. Miss Linton must have been about 60 years old and looked like a cross between Margaret Rutherford and Elsa Lanchester as the bride of Frankenstein. She was quite scary to look at with a very strange haircut for a woman, just like my dad's, I thought. But behind it all there was indeed kindly old Margaret Rutherford. Looking back now, it seems obvious to me that my first close female friend was a lesbian. Miss Linton spotted me quite early on after my arrival at the school and always took special care in teaching me. If I found something difficult, she would invite me to her home, which was opposite ours and next to the village church, in the evenings, for a drink, she always said. She would drink whiskey and I would drink lemonade. Some of her lessons were very unorthodox when I was having a problem with maths. She taught me how to play poker for real pennies and always arranged to lose so that I would go home a penny or two ahead. I was always an avid reader of anything, but Miss Linton guided me into the sort of books that I should read. And although I was only eight, she allowed me to borrow books from the senior school library, normally meant for children over 14. Unknown to me, she had an ulterior motive. At that time, in English schools, you had to take a scholarship exam to pass out of elementary school into the higher education of grammar school. No child from this little village school had ever passed this exam, and she saw in me a possible candidate for glory before she retired or died. As she smoked at least a hundred cigarettes a day, and one of my jobs was an almost continuous errand to get her cigarettes, one pack at a time, the latter was more likely. After a couple of years of her personal tutoring, I did indeed pass the scholarship exam, and brought glory at last to my school. I never saw Miss Linton happier than the day she came rushing across the village green to our house to inform me that I had passed, her school gown flying in the breeze like big black wings, Margaret Rutherford as a fallen angel. Without her, my future life would have been such a dreary place. Not long afterwards, the cigarettes I had bought for her did their job, and she died of lung cancer. I was so relieved that she had seen that I had not let her down before she went. Just before I passed the exam, my mother got a job as a cook at the Grange, a big house on the outskirts of the village, and we were suddenly moved from the farmhouse into the servants' quarters there. The luxury was unbelievable. My brother and I had our own bedroom with a bed each, and my mother had her bedroom next door. Our flat was beautifully furnished, and the sheets and the pillows were the softest we had ever known. There was a bathroom with a sink and a toilet in it beside a big bath. And there was not only a tap for cold water, but one for hot water as well. We'd never had that before. The first thing I noticed about the bath was that it had two sets of taps. And when I turned the top one on, I was drenched in a rush of water that seemed to be coming out of the ceiling. I switched the tap off quickly and standing there dripping, I looked up to see a big brass funnel with holes in it. We moved into our new billet just before the holidays and before I got the results of my scholarship exam. During this time, I'd got to know the master of the house, a very impressive-looking man called Mr. English, who was about 55 years old. He was always asking me questions about myself and how I was doing at school and what I wanted to do when I grew up. My mother was very puzzled at the interest he was taking in my welfare for a while, as in her experience, people of his class did not normally waste their precious time in conversation with the son of a cook. The answer to his strange behaviour came one evening after dinner, when a message was sent through asking if my mother and I would join Mr and Mrs English in the drawing room. This was a big moment for me, as I had never been allowed into that part of the house before. My mother and I crept nervously along the wide passage and knocked on the door, which was immediately opened by Mr English himself. Come in and sit down, he said with a broad smile. 
Mrs. English, a tall, aristocratic-looking woman with slightly grey hair, was sitting on the sofa. We all sat down, and he explained to my mother that the reason he had asked us in was to tell us that he knew that I had taken the scholarship exam because he had asked Miss Linton all about me, and he just wanted to tell me that if I did not pass the exam, he was going to pay for my education anyway, because, much to my embarrassment, he said I was much too bright a boy to let go to waste. We stumbled out of the room, and the moment we were outside, my mother gave me a big hug and told me that I was made for life if a man like Mr. English had taken this much interest in me. As it turned out, I passed the exam anyway, but it was nice to know that someone in this world gave a damn about what happened to the likes of us. Having won the scholarship place, I had to change schools. This was a change that turned out not only to be geographic and educational, but social as well. I was sent to a Jewish school called Hackney Downs Grocers. As I had won a London scholarship, I had to go to the nearest London school, which had been evacuated to my area, and this turned out to be Grocers, as we called it. The first day at school was a bit of a disappointment. I had expected that Jewish boys would look different or strange in some way, but looking round the hall at assembly on the first day, I could see nothing to distinguish them from anybody else. Prayers were started and on came the vicar, but he didn't look like any vicar that I had ever seen. And he started to sing a prayer in a strange language that I had never heard before. I asked the boy next to me what was going on. He told me that this was their rabbi and he was singing in a language called Hebrew. One thing that I noticed very quickly was that he sang much better than any vicar that I had ever heard. The boys at Grocer's were much better behaved than the boys at the other schools that I had been to, and much more keen on their work. There were only a few dumb ones, and they rapidly became my friends. There was no way that I was ever going to be as diligent as the top students in the school. My particular friend was a boy called Morris, and I spent a great deal of time at home with his family, who knew that I was on my own and made me an honorary family member. It was here that I could see where the differences of attitude towards education had come from in these boys. Morris's family absolutely doted on him and pressed home to him all the time the importance of education for his later life. It was 1946 when I got back to London, and what a shock that was. Whole streets around where we lived had disappeared, leaving great stretches of land piled high with rubble and dotted with the still-standing remnants of ruined buildings. There was a continual smell of burning rubbish as the government sent teams of men in to clear the bomb sites. And this odour is one of my lingering memories from that period of my life. To add to the general misery at the time, there was an added plague that came when coal went off the rationing list. The heating in most of the houses was done by coal fires, and the smog that this produced was the most disgusting in the history of mankind. It was almost pure soot and impossible to see through at all. I once got lost for an hour, 200 yards from my home. They worry about smog in Los Angeles, but they never had anything like this. We had won the war, but the shops were empty. And even to get your legal ration of things, you had to queue for hours. The one light in the middle of all this gloom was the cinema, where I could escape for a couple of hours to somewhere better, usually... America. I really don't know what I would have done at that time without the cinema and the public library. The two places where I could escape the grim reality of everyday life. It was in the library that I found a book on how to act in films, which claimed that actors should never blink before the camera. I walked around for months with a blank, unblinking stare in order to prepare for my film career scaring the shit out of any strangers with whom I happened to come into contact. But I managed eventually to go without blinking for first ten, then twenty minutes at a time, and was well on my way to Hollywood. I also managed to get an eye infection from the filthy air as the particles of soot built up in my eyes. One has to make sacrifices for one's art, I'm told, and that is an early example of one of mine. My father had returned from the war unscathed, having gone right through from the Battle of El Alamein, to the liberation of Rome. I was now twelve years old, my brother was six, and the council gave us a prefabricated house. These were sent over from Canada and America in ready-made asbestos sections 
constructed like a big do-it-yourself doll's house and were intended to be temporary accommodation until the government could set about building proper homes for the victims of the war and slum clearance. In fact, quite a lot of slum clearance had already been done by the Luftwaffe. The district we lived in was called the Elephant and Castle, but no one ever said the whole phrase. If you were asked where you came from, you just said the elephant, and if you could keep a reasonably straight face, this was usually enough to strike terror into anyone from outside the area. Wilson's Grammar School, the one that was to replace Hackney Downs Grocers, because it was now the closest, came into my life. I will pass a veil over this period of my life. Suffice it to say that I hated this school and the compliment was returned in spades. There was only one man there that I really liked, an English teacher called Watson, who took the trouble to guide my rebellious mind into the world of literature. My only other interest was French, which I took to with great enthusiasm, not so much because of a thirst to learn a foreign language, but because the French teacher was the only female in the school. Mademoiselle used to teach sitting on the front of her desk. She had great legs and always wore short skirts, short for that time anyway, which would ride up as she sat back. Once in position, she would cross her legs every five minutes or so, at which moments there was an audible intake of communal breath and the briefest of pauses in the sound of scratching pen nips. The first words that I ever looked up in my French dictionary were white knickers. In case you're interested, they are culotte blanche. My main ambition while at this school was to spend as little time as possible there, which I managed by playing truant whenever we had to play sport. The journey from school to the playing fields was long and unchecked, and as I was so bad at sports that nobody wanted me on their team, I was never missed. Sports featured on three afternoons a week, which gave me plenty of time to indulge in my real love. Surprise, surprise, the cinema. My best friend at school was a very studious boy called Derek Coles, who, like me, hated sports, but unlike me, was a keen worker in the classroom and clever. It was Derek who put me on the road to Hollywood by taking me to a youth club that he had joined called Clubland in the Woolworth Road. At Clubland, the young men were expected to tear into the gym and start racing around after a ball or leap over wooden horses and climb ropes to make us all too exhausted to start anything with the girls. Amy Hood was the object of my lust at the time, and never having been in the society of girls before, I was very shy, so I had to work out a way to get close to her. One day, I was making my way up the stairs to the gym for basketball practice, when I passed a door with a little window in it, and there, framed in the window, was Amy, surrounded by all the prettiest girls in the club. I was leaning on the door, staring at this bevy of potential romance, when the door swung in and I found myself standing in the room, trapped. The girls all stared at me for a moment, and then the teacher came towards me, smiling in welcome. Come in, she said. We haven't got any boys, she added mysteriously. You're the first one to join this year. What class is this, I mumbled. The drama class. It came to me in a flash. I could kill two birds with one stone. I could learn to act and go to Hollywood and maybe get to kiss Amy in one of the plays. So I was on my way to becoming an actor for all the wrong reasons, typical of me. I did get to kiss Amy and all the other girls at one time or another, but none of them ever succumbed to my blandishments to go further. But I didn't mind at all because I fell in love with acting. My first role was not overly ambitious. I thought it better to start slowly. I played a robot who spoke in a flat mechanical voice and only said one line in the whole play. This, I thought, was a modest enough debut and was insurance against making a complete fool of myself. The play was a very intellectual piece called R.U.R., which stood for Rossum's Universal Robots and was written by a Czech writer named Carol Kapek. Not for the last time, as it turned out, was I doing a play in which I did not understand what the hell was going on or what anybody was talking about, including my own single line. The big night came and went very quickly. My only memory of it was that I was far more nervous than I thought I was going to be, and that everybody who was great in rehearsal was bad in performance, and vice versa. A situation that many years later I found occurred in the professional theatre. 
As for my own performance, I got my first review in the club magazine. I already knew and disliked the boy who was the critic, who struck me as being a sarcastic bastard, and for once my judgment of character was right on the button. Maurice Micklewhite, he wrote, played the robot who spoke in a dull, mechanical, monotonous voice to perfection. Portents of things to come in later life. Although my role was a modest one, I felt a great sense of excitement in putting on the show and a feeling of tremendous achievement after it was all over that I had never felt before. For the rest of my time at the club, until I was called up to serve in the British Army, I was always in some show or another. At the club I met a man called Alec Reed, who was a tremendous film buff and used to run his magnificent collection of 16mm silent films on a Sunday evening in the club theatre. This man knew more about film than anyone I'd ever met before or since. He spotted my interest very quickly and took it upon himself to educate me in the history of film and to a certain extent in the making of them. Every summer the whole club used to go on holiday to the island of Guernsey off the south coast of England and Alec used to make documentaries of our trips. He let me help with the camera while he explained the lenses he was using and about shots and angles. He even gave me a director's credit on a film one year. My proudest moment to date when I saw my name on the screen for the first time. I knew from the giggles and sarcastic remarks around me as Maurice Micklewhite, director, came up on the screen that if I ever got into professional acting, I was going to have to change my name. A problem that was going to fill my every spare moment for the next five years. The more I worked with Alec Reed on his films, the more I became interested in the technical side of movie making. But I wasn't very happy when Alec, after seeing me in several plays as an actor, subtly suggested that perhaps I should aim for a directing career instead. It wasn't surprising. Alec was a very kind man, and I think he thought this young, skinny, unattractive boy with a thick Cockney accent, with absolutely no family history in show business, and not even the remotest contact with anybody in it, was going to have the disappointment of his life one day, and he was trying to let me down gently as early as possible. I had a few doubts of my own. All the stars at that time had black hair and were very handsome, Robert Taylor, Tyron Power and Cary Grant, to name but three stunning examples. Even the ugly ones like Paul Muni, Humphrey Bogart and Edward G. Robinson had black hair and were attractive in their own way. It was a great worry that being ugly and fair-haired meant that my future as an actor was not necessarily a foregone conclusion. I was also six feet tall and painfully thin, and this brought about my next phobia. My nose was too big. The thinner you get, the bigger it gets, and there were no stars with a really big nose except Jimmy Durante, and although I loved him, I could, I could not see him in the role of the ladies' man, which, of course, was my real aim. Help was at hand for me, though, in the shape of Spencer Tracy, who had blonde hair, a kind of a big nose, and did not look like a Latin lover. When I first saw him, my spirit soared, but the clincher came when I saw my first European movie. It was a French film, Le Jour Se Lève, which Alec Reed had taken me to see, and it starred the man who finally convinced me that I could make it. His name was Jean Gabin, and he featured everything that I thought could hold me back. Fair hair, a big nose, and a small mouth. He was the biggest star in France, so everything was now possible. The other thing that Spencer Tracy and Jean Gabin had in common was that they were both great actors, something that with the best will in the world could not be said of most of the movie stars at the time, or even now for that matter. Forget the looks, I told myself. You are going to have to become the best possible actor that you can be. We decided to take one of the plays to some of the local youth organisations and it was on this tour that I met a guy named Paul Challen who was to become my lifelong friend. We had gone to do a play at the Home for Orphan Boys, a depressing place, even by my lowly standards, and everybody there looked as unhealthy and as unhappy as they could be without actually killing themselves. After the show, I walked out of the creepy place as fast as I could. Out of the gloom, on the dim, lamp-lit street, a strange, gaunt figure appeared. He was about the same age as me and the same height, around six feet, but that is where the resemblance ended. I thought I was thin, but this guy really made me look quite portly. 
He had a gaunt, sunken face with a pale white skin stretched tightly over cheekbones that looked as though they might break through at any moment. My name's Paul, he whispered, as though it was a secret. He had a very gentle voice. I know your name from the program. I put out my hand. Pleased to meet you, I said. And that was the start of a friendship that has lasted for well over forty years and kept me from going insane at times. Do you really want to be an actor one day, he asked. Yes, I do. Do you know how to get started, he asked. I had no idea and was taken aback when he suggested we tried to find out together. Paul was the first person I had ever told that I wanted to be a professional. Up until then it had only been a dream. Not only did he not laugh at me, which is what would have happened if I would told anybody else that I knew, but he wanted to be one too. Paul never joined the club with me, but he always met me outside each evening, and we would walk the grim street sometimes until dawn, talking of what we were going to do and who we were going to be. I had had a lot of mates and chums, but Paul was my first real friend, and he was to prove it over and over again as the years went on. My experiences as an evacuee were, for the most part, pleasant and most of the time actually beneficial. But I had always felt a bit sorry for myself at being so poor. By this time I had read hundreds of books and knew what life was like for people who had money. One day I asked Paul how he became an orphan. My mother, he said, without any emotion, gave me some money to run round the butchers and get some sausages for lunch. He took the money, got the sausage, but when he was coming out of the shop, the air raid warning went, so he ran down the shelter. When the raid was over, he ran back home quickly, but when he arrived, his home was gone, and so was his entire family. That was it. All I had in the world were the clothes I was wearing, a pound of sausages in one hand, and some change in the other. We never mentioned it again, either of us. And I never felt sorry for myself again either. After the war, the British government started a scheme whereby every 18-year-old boy learned to defend his country for two years. They called it National Service. Throughout the years during which National Service applied, 99.9% .9 of the victims did their time under peacetime conditions in more or less attractive locations like England or Germany or Cyprus or Suez, or Hong Kong, or Singapore, or if you were particularly lucky, the West Indies. It was just my luck that my innings coincided with a war, which meant that I was posted to a hill in Korea, just across a valley from another hill which was home to innumerable Chinese, every one of whom was determined to shoot me dead. Even if I hadn't been an impressionable youth, which I was, this experience would have left its mark on me, which it did. Even now, the realization that I survived unscathed gives me a warm glow of relief. Roll on de mob was the heartfelt cry, and eventually my battalion of the Royal Fusiliers returned to England, and demobilization day dawned for me and for my companions in arms, Harry, Lenny, Frank, and Jack. We handed in our kit, put on our civilian clothes, now hopelessly out of date, and walked out of the barracks together. Our regimental band was practicing Colonel Bogey, the march made famous in the film The Bridge Over the River Kwai. We had our own words for it, as soldiers will, and as we crossed the barrack square, we started to sing. Hitler has only got one ball. Goring has two but very small. Himmler is very similar, but poor old go balls has no balls at all. The refrain which is repeated goes... Barlocks, and the same to you, which summed up our attitude to the military in general. As we were seeing this, the band suddenly changed its tune and struck up our own regimental march, which brought about an instant change in our attitude. Because this was our march, and we found that we did have some pride in what we had been through and what we had done. Without thinking, we all straightened up, formed a line, and very smartly marched out of the army forever, singing our own words again. Here we come, here we come, bullshitting bastards, everyone. Once out of the gate, we stopped, shook hands, and each went in his own direction. And as I sat on the bus going home to the elephant, 
I thought, that's what I am. A bullshitting bastard. Show business is the life for me. I had absolutely no idea how I was going to start to become an actor. I sat in the prefab trying to work out my first step on a ladder that did not yet exist. After a while I started getting hints from my father about what I should do. Why don't you get up off your ass and get a job, he demanded. So I went and I got a job in a butter factory. Sometimes when I'm asked if I believe in God, people are very surprised when I tell them that I do. But if you have lived my life and seen the luck I've had, you would believe in him as well. The first example of this mysterious helping hand came to me right out of the blue. Working with me in the factory was a little old man who one day told me, for no reason at all, that he had a daughter in show business, a semi-professional singer who made quite a nice living out of it. I told him that I wanted to be an actor one day myself. But I didn't know how to go about starting. Why don't you get the stage newspaper, he asked. I didn't even know what the stage was. He told me that I could buy it on Fridays at a newsagent called Solosi in Charing Cross Road. On Saturday morning I was at Solosi's when they opened, and in I went, plucked up courage, and asked for it. Making my way to Leicester Square, I sat on a seat in the gardens there and started to read. The only thing suitable seemed to be for an assistant stage manager required to play small parts, and the address was a theatre in a small country town called Horsham in Sussex. Applicants were asked for a photo and stamped addressed envelope. There were few photographs of me in existence at all, but I, I soon fixed this by going to one of a group of chain photographers called Gemro. They were all over the country. The photo made my lips look as though I had lipstick on, and the rather sickly smile that I had mustered at the photographer's request made the whole effect rather effeminate. I didn't have enough money for another go, so the only thing to do was to send the picture off. A week later I got a reply asking me to put in an appearance at the theatre and on a Saturday morning when I was not working I set off to meet Mr. Alwyn D. Fox, the owner of the company. He was a small, rather grisly man of about fifty and the minute he spoke I realised that he was a homosexual. Christ, I thought. Mr. Fox looked me over with a certain gleam in his eye which was disconcerting to say the least because I suddenly realised that he was looking at me the same way that I looked at girls. I was twenty years old, six feet two, with long, blonde, curly hair. I'd done a lot of weight training over the years, so I was very well built and still had the residue of the suntan I'd got on the boat coming home. You don't give the same impression in life that you do in your photos, do you, said Mr. Fox, with a tinge of disappointment. I'm sorry, I said, as though I'd deliberately misled him. Nothing to be sorry about, he said with a smile. You might do. Edgar? From out of nowhere came a man even smaller than Mr. Fox and very slender indeed. Mr. Fox and Edgar both stood staring at me, each with one arm across his body, holding the elbow of the other arm and one hand up by their faces with a finger on their pursed lips. Edgar said, well, it'll be all right for those small butch parts like policemen that we have so much difficulty with. Do you think you can do stage management? Alwyn inquired. I had no idea what this was, but I answered with an immediate and confident yes. All right, said Alwyn Fox. I'll try you out for a couple of weeks. Can you start on Monday? Stage management, I quickly learned, was doing everything that nobody else wanted to do. I made tea all day, shifted scenery, placed props, ran errands for everything from cigarettes for the leading man to tampax for the leading lady. And on the weekends, when the show changed, took back all the furniture that we had borrowed from various stores and begged them to lend us a new lot. I was earning two pounds, ten shillings per week. And as my room in a local theatrical boarding house cost exactly two pounds, ten shillings per week, this did not leave a lot left over. I found that in the theatre, women did not mind paying for themselves, or even me sometimes, and as everybody in the company, of course, earned more than I did, I never seemed to be without. Part of the reason was that as stage manager, I was responsible for the food that was eaten on stage and the cigarettes that were smoked. So at the end of each evening when the show was over, I finished up what was left. 
All the cast used to gather in the pub after the show, and I was always given drinks, and my rent did include an evening meal, so life was not too bad. When the time came to play my first role as a professional actor, it was indeed as the butch policeman who takes away the villain after he has been unmasked by the upper crust amateur sleuth. I forget the name of the play, but I do remember my line, which was, Come along with me, sir. I was so nervous that I forgot to do my flies up and got a laugh the moment I walked on. As this was the end of a very intense drama, it wasn't quite the effect that the company was aiming at. The laughter threw me completely and I forgot my line. When one of the actors whispered it to me, his voice was so soft I did not hear what he said, and I replied, What? in a normal voice. My first attempt at professional acting was over. I got a great bollocking from Alwyn, and I did not appear again for another three weeks. I was cast in my next part out of sheer desperation on the part of the management. The role was that of a seducer of women and a cat. With the best will in the world, Alwyn must have realised that I was the only man in the whole company who looked as if he might do such a thing. It was not a leading role, but the scene did last about five minutes. I had to bring an innocent girl back to my flat and seduce her by plying her with alcohol. On I came, looking as suave and as urbane as it was possible for someone to look who had no idea what these two words meant. The suit with which I had been issued when I was demobbed from the army didn't help. It had never fitted me very well at the best of times, but my diet at the theatre had lost me quite a bit of weight and now it sagged quite heavily on my shoulders. This, coupled with a feeling of abject terror at the thought of having it to remember, meant that I did not cut the figure of the lounge lizard that I had fondly imagined. The actress who was going to have to convince an audience that she was about to be seduced by this terrified oaf was June Wyndham Davis, and she was superb, not only on this occasion, but the many other times that she was forced to work with me. She was always patient, gentle and kind. Virtues that are not, you may be surprised to know, abundant in the heart of most leading actresses. She taught me so much in my time with her, and I shall be eternally grateful to this long-suffering saint. The conviction of June's performance was not helped by the fact that she had to get gradually drunk as I plied her with liquor from a bottle which in my nervous state I had forgotten to open. She eventually overcame this problem by grabbing the bottle out of my hand and removing the cork, and then inventing some mad plot twist where she suddenly drank the whole bottle down in one go, just in time for her cue to collapse in a seducible state on the bed. When we came off at the finish of the scene, she gave me a kiss and congratulated me at having made my real start as an actor. She told me later that all I said to her was, that was worse than anything that I did in Korea. Much of the training I got there continues with me, I still always check my flies before a take in memory of my first embarrassing entrance and I always bring a pencil to rehearsals to write down the moves after having Alwyn scream at me The first thing that you need to become an actor is a pencil! He also screamed at me for a mistake during the performance of a play. There was a scene where nobody would speak to me and I had to sit in the corner downstage. One of the elderly ladies in the audience took pity on me because I was on my own and nobody in the cast was speaking to me and she got up out of her seat, reached over the footlights, and offered me a sweet. Being always hungry, I took it. Directly the curtain came down, Alwyn was backstage, yelling at me again. How dare you break the fourth wall, he shouted. I had no idea what he was talking about. It's the invisible wall between you and the audience. If you are in a room, you have four walls. In the theatre, we have an invisible fourth wall, so that the audience can see us. You must never, ever break it. I apologised wondering just how many more pitfalls there were for me to encounter. As it happened, my next problem was non-theatrical. I succumbed to an attack of malaria, a legacy of my time in Korea. I was quite ill for some time, and when I got back on my feet, I found that the Horsham Company had folded up. However, the experience I had accumulated there entitled me to apply for jobs in the experienced junior degree. This I did, and I managed to get myself hired by a repertory company in Lowestoft, 
on the east coast of England. It was a lovely theatre, and the standard of the company was a good step up from Horsham. The producer was a fabulous old man of about seventy, who always seemed to have the right advice for any problems. I was playing a drunk scene in one of the plays that I did, and on the first rehearsal, when I entered, playing what I imagined to be a pretty good drunk, he stopped me and said, What do you call this? I'm playing a drunk, I replied. That's right, that is exactly what you are doing, but I'm not paying you to play a drunk. I'm paying you to be a drunk. I don't understand, I called back out into the gloom of the unlit auditorium. You are being an actor who is trying to walk crooked and speak with a slurred voice like a drunk. Don't you realize that a drunk is a man who is trying to walk straight and speak properly? I got it in one invaluable lesson. On another occasion, I was on stage for a long period and I had no dialogue. What are you doing? he suddenly shouted at me during my long silence. Nothing, I replied. I haven't got any lines for a long while yet. Of course you have, he shouted. No, I haven't, I shouted back. You are listening to everything that is being said and you are thinking of wonderful lines to say. But you just decide not to say anything until your next line. That is what you are doing. Don't tell me again that you have nothing to do on stage. Remember, always listen. That is half of acting. And reacting to what you hear is the other half. It's as simple as that. Thank you, sir, I said sincerely. Those two pieces of advice had just described film acting. But I wasn't to find that out until later. One of the things that I learned very early on in provincial repertory was that there is an unspoken sexual hierarchy which decrees that the leading lady only sleeps with the leading man, the juvenile male lead with his female counterpart, and so on down to the male and female stage managers. I was the juvenile lead, but after a week or two, I found myself being irresistibly drawn towards that forbidden figure, the leading lady. Pat was a very tall woman, about five feet nine, an absolute beauty, two years older than myself and a wonderful actress. In other words, she was an impossible dream. This did not impair my growing fascination, however, despite the fact that my feelings were obviously not returned, for even after two weeks with the company, she had still not registered my presence as the new juvenile lead. One Saturday night after the show, one of the actors gave a party in his digs to which the whole company was invited. This would be my chance, I thought, my first social occasion with her. But a polite hello was all I got. So there I was alone and dejected, sitting in the corner, trying to look romantic. As I sat there, it began to dawn on me that I was hopelessly in love with her. The party began to thin out, and it got late, and I slumped there getting drunk to drown my sorrow, and taking no notice of anybody. Are you shy? a voice said behind me. I turned, and Pat was standing there looking down at me. Shy? I mumbled, lurching to my feet and spilling my drink down my trousers. Me? Shy? Why do you say that? I was trying to dry the front of my trousers and look sophisticated and romantic at the same time and failing miserably at both. Because you've been fancying me ever since you came here, and yet you've never made a pass. She was a North Country girl, and they have a reputation for being very forthright. We were married a few weeks later at the registry office in Lowestoft, with the whole company present. Pat's mother and father, Claire and Reg, had come down from Sheffield, where they lived, and where Pat was born. I liked my father-in-law immediately, but my mother-in-law was obviously a bit worried about her daughter marrying someone from my background. However, she kept quiet and made the best of things. We decided to try our luck in London and inform the producer of our intentions. With his good wishes, we set off to make our fortunes in the big city. Our first home was a small two-room flat in a run-down area of South London called Brixton. It was owned by my Aunt Ellen, and we only had to pay a nominal rent of a couple of pounds, which was just as well as things turned out. From the start, neither of our careers prospered. Pat's was a little healthier than mine, but even then we only made just enough money to survive. 
I occasionally got small jobs on television, just walk-on parts, no dialogue. But eventually gave up looking for acting work because Pat was the more talented of the two of us and had the most chance of success. We decided that I would get some ordinary jobs to keep the money coming in while she promoted her career and then when she had made enough money I could restart my own. So I began a long line of soul-destroying jobs. I worked in a laundry for a while, wheeling trolleys of dirty clothes into the boilers. I washed up at a restaurant and also had a long stint as a plumber's mate. By now I had met up again with my old friend from Clubland days, Paul Challen. He was now an actor himself, finding the going as tough as we were, and having to do our jobs as well. Then Pat became pregnant and had our daughter Dominic. Although this was a happy event in our financial circumstances, it was the last thing that we needed. And our new baby was the wonderful straw that broke an already very weak camel's back. My luck grew ever worse and I just couldn't handle it any longer. I walked out on the marriage and Pat took Dominique back to her parents in Sheffield. They were marvellous and brought her up and turned her into a great young woman who I love dearly and am very proud of. The breakdown of the marriage was my fault entirely. I was too young and immature to take the triple burden of grinding poverty and personal and professional failure. If I had been as strong as Pat, I think that we could have made it, but I wasn't, and I collapsed like a house of cards. The other problem was that I knew my weakness, and I had to live with it. Now started the most terrible period of my life so far. Out of work, penniless, and in deep, almost suicidal despair, I was forced at the age of 23 to return to the prefab and rely on the generosity of my family again. My father was out of work, bedridden, with rheumatism of the spine. I went out and got a job in a steel yard just to bring some money into the house. Every evening I used to rub my father's aching back with liniment to try and get rid of the pain, until our doctor took me aside one day and explained that he had cancer of the liver and had only a few weeks to live. Very quickly he went from his normal fourteen stone to half that weight, and still I massaged him to keep the fact of his true illness from him. Eventually an ambulance came and took him away to St. Thomas's Hospital to die. His condition deteriorated rapidly. He was in excruciating pain. I asked the doctor to increase his drugs and he told me that a larger dose would kill him. I looked at him for a moment and said, If this is living, can death be such a bad thing? He thought for a moment, then asked me to go away and come back at eleven o'clock that night. I was back there at eleven on the dot. Dad seemed to be much more comfortable now, and I sat there holding his hand for an hour or so. Occasionally he would squeeze my hand and I would squeeze back. The hospital is right opposite the Houses of Parliament, and I could see Big Ben across the river. Eventually it struck one o'clock, and as it did, my father's eyes opened slightly and he whispered, Good luck, son, and die. I told the doctor that he had gone and thanked him for all that he had done and walked back down the corridor. As I was walking, I could hear someone running after me. It was a nurse. She caught up with me and holding out her hand, she said, this was in your father's pyjama pocket and handed me three shillings and eightpence. This was everything that my father left us. Nothing else. After fifty-six years of working like a beast of burden. Soon I lost my job at the steel yard and now I really was at the bottom. I felt that I could not cope mentally with any more disaster. But I didn't know what to do. My mother found the answer, retrieving the insurance policies that she'd taken out on my father all those years ago, the ones I used to lie about to the collector when she was short of money. She found the ones she had taken out and paid in my name, on which she had collected twenty-five pounds. This she gave to me and told me to go away somewhere for a while, and cut up and felt better. It may sound strange to anybody hearing this today, 
as you wouldn't get very far on £25 these days. But my return fare on the night boat train to Paris was £7.10. Paris was my choice because I'd been reading about it for years and actually felt as if I knew it. I'd been particularly influenced by an American novel called Springtime in Paris by Elliot Paul, which centred on a particular street called Rue de la Huchette. From the book, I knew that it was situated just behind the Saint-Michel metro station on Place Saint-Michel. So that is where I headed. The Place Saint-Michel is a large square right on the banks of the River Seine, with the Pont Saint-Michel at one end and a big statue with a fountain gushing out of it at the other. On the corner, right by the metro exit, was a cafe where I went and sat for two hours, just watching the world go by. Saint-Michel is the centre of the student quarter. Everybody seemed to be young and full of enthusiasm about anything and everything. In my schoolboy French, I ordered a Citroën Presse. The waiter asked me loudly in English why I wanted a squash car. This was my first taste of how shitty the French can be with foreigners who try to speak their language. What I really wanted was a citron to squeeze lemon. I changed my mind immediately and ordered a café. At least I could handle that. I did not order squeezed lemon again for many years. To save money, I walked everywhere, and Paris is the greatest city in the world for walking. Over a period of a couple of weeks, I discovered every nook and cranny of it, and I loved everything I saw. I'll always feel grateful to this city, because I'm sure that my stay there saved me from a nervous breakdown. One evening, I suddenly found myself broke and without a room. They did not give credit at my hotel. It was getting dark and late, and I was becoming desperate for somewhere to sleep, and I hit on an idea. In my exploration, I had come across the air terminal at the Gare Saint-Lazare. I was carrying a suitcase so I could pass as a passenger, and in an air terminal there must be lots of people who had to wait a long time and happened to fall asleep in the chairs. Off I went, and I was right. There were people everywhere dozing in armchairs with suitcases. So... That's what I did, too. There were a few obvious bums that the police threw out, but I quickly took care of this problem. I sauntered over to one of the waste paper baskets and took out an old Air France ticket stub that had been thrown away and fell asleep in a very comfortable chair with my suitcase between my legs and the ticket stub clenched prominently in my hand. The police could not see that there was no ticket in sight. During the night, I became very hungry. There was a young guy on a buffet bar at the end of the hall, and about two o'clock in the morning, he started to pack up. I went over and asked him if he had any stale sandwiches that he was going to throw away. I was speaking in my faltering French, but to my surprise, he answered me in English, with an American accent. You don't want to eat any stale sandwiches, I'll make you some fresh. And he went out the back and returned with half a dozen beautiful fresh ones. I ate two of them and put the rest in my suitcase. He then gave me a hot chocolate and a couple of bottles of Coke to put in my case for later. The next day I walked all over Paris searching for some odd job to do. I couldn't get a real one because I didn't have a work permit. I couldn't find a thing. The next night I returned to the air terminal where my American friend filled me up with food again and supplied me with some for the next day and then I bedded down again on the seat. I was woken up just before dawn by a gendarme who wished to see my ticket stuff. He threw me out with words that I did not actually understand, something along the lines that if I came back he would shove his trunch up my derriere. I dashed out under the pavement just ahead of a boot in the arse and stood there looking around at the city as the sun started to rise. Where to go now was the next question. I thought for a moment and suddenly remembered a place called the Boulevard Clichy that I had come across in my explorations. This was a real low-life quarter, full of strip clubs, pimps and prostitutes, but it had one advantage. It did stay open all night, and there might at least be something going on there. I arrived just as all the nightclubs were closing and the drunks and revellers were blearily facing their trip home to bed. As for me, I just sat on a bench on the wide pavement in the middle of the boulevard and indulged in my favourite free pastime, people watching. The sun came right up and I started to feel more hopeful. The revellers were thinning out now as more sober citizens took their place and little snack bars began to open up. 
Opposite where I was sitting, one particular place was doing a roaring trade. It was just in a hole in the wall joint that sold beer, coffee and hot dogs. And on the pavement outside was a machine that made french fries, which were sold by the bag. There were only about a dozen seats and a little bar. Only one man was running this place. And very soon he was getting overwhelmed. As I sat there, I thought, maybe he could use an extra pair of hands to clip dirty glasses and wash up. So I waited for a brief lull, and then went over and suggested it. He agreed to take me on for a minimal sum, all that he was prepared to offer, but there it was, at least I had a job. I put my case behind the counter and started work immediately. In the evening he gave me my money, which was just enough for a flea pit room at a flea bag hotel. The work was hard, the hours long, and the pay small, but I didn't mind. I could stay in Paris a little longer. While I worked at the snack bar, I came to know some of the most unsavoury people in Paris. Tarts, thieves, pimps and gangsters, and the mugs who were soon parted from their money. It was also a very dangerous area. Killings and fights occurred almost every single night that I worked on the Boulevard Clichy. When I eventually made it home, my mother greeted me with, Where the hell have you been? Your agent sent a telegram yesterday. We had no phone. What did it say? She handed it to me and I read Call tomorrow, have a job for you. Urgent. I rang my agent, a lovely old Scotsman called Jimmy Fraser. He told me that he'd got me a part in a film. A miracle. I couldn't believe it. I hadn't even had a speaking part on television yet. What's it called? A Hill in Korea. It's about the war. It's only a small part and they want you to be the technical advisor on the film because of your experience over there. How much was the pay and for how long and where were my next questions? A hundred pounds a week for eight weeks, Jimmy told me. And we would be shooting on location in Portugal and the studio in Shepparton, one of our major studios at the time. You start in six weeks, he said, and put the phone down. Six weeks later, I was up and away to Portugal with the cast and crew of a hill in Korea. The star was George Baker, who is now appearing on television as Inspector Wexford in the Ruth Rendell Mysteries. George was, and is, one of the nicest actors in the business. The director was a wonderful man called Julian Amis. He was not only very patient and kind to me and helped my career by giving me my first speaking role in a film, but he also gave me my first speaking role in television a few months later. Some of the other unknown actors in the cast were Stanley Baker, Stephen Boyd and Robert Shaw. Stephen and I became friends and when we were shooting back in England he used to give me a lift to the studios every day in an old banger of a car that he owned at the time. He was the first one of the cast to make it as a star and shortly after the film opened he disappeared into the rarefied atmosphere of Hollywood. I never saw him again and he eventually died of a heart attack while he was still very young. My function as a technical advisor was completely ignored during the making of the film. For example, I advised the crew to spread the troops wide as they advanced, which was militarily correct, but they replied that they didn't have a lens wide enough to take it all in. I also pointed out that the officer would have removed his signs of rank and worn a hat the same as the other men, to disguise which one was in command. But George was allowed to go into battle with all badges and hat gleaming, every inch an officer. In a real fight it would have lasted all of ten seconds. The most glaring mistake that I never brought to their notice was that Portugal did not in the least resemble Korea. If anything, Wales was more similar. I didn't say anything because I wanted to stay in Portugal. I could go to Wales any old time. When the location part of the film was finished, we came back to England and started to shoot at Shepparton. I found myself a flat in Earl's Court, then a very seedy area of cheap lodging houses in West London. I teamed up again with my old friend Paul Challen, who had been living there for quite a while. I finished the film and then had the time and the money to visit my daughter Dominique, who was now living permanently with Pat's mother and father in Sheffield. I went with a mixture of anticipation and dread. I wanted so much to see my daughter, but feared that I would not be received with exactly open arms by Reg and Claire Haynes. As it turned out, I was wrong. Dominique was a beautiful little blonde girl, now one year old, and I fell in love with her immediately. By the time I left, I felt that I had at least started some sort of bond with her, so life was great. 
all my problems seemed to be receding. But not for long. Jimmy Fraser saw the finished film and dropped me from his list of clients. Not having seen the film myself, I jumped to the correct conclusion that my screen debut had not been an unqualified success. When I eventually saw it, I had no reason to revise that view. I was terrible. I found a new agent, a lovely lady called Josephine Burton. Work did not come pouring in, but with a few odd jobs I managed to exist. I had to move out of my flat and go back to living at the Elephant with my mother and brother Stanley. Christmas was approaching and I was getting desperate for any money at all when I was sent to the theatre workshop in the East End of London, where a brilliant woman called Joan Littlewood was putting on her own Christmas production of Charles Dickens' The Chimes. The wages, a measly two pounds ten shillings a week, were back to the day I started at Horsham, and here I was, twenty-four years old. Brilliant as Joan Littlewood was, she failed to notice my talent, and I was in trouble as soon as I stepped on stage for the first rehearsal. As I appeared from behind the curtain, she yelled from the auditorium, We don't want any of that. Come on again. I duly exited and re-entered, not knowing what any of that was. Again she stopped me. This is a group theatre. We don't want any of that. So off I went and on I came. She stopped me yet again. I'm not having it. Not having what, I asked, genuinely perplexed. Any of this star nonsense, you bury your individuality in the character, for the good of the group and the play as a whole. I tried to blend with the group and immerse my personality, but I never really did it to Joan's satisfaction, and when the production finished, instead of taking me on in the main company, she got rid of me with the most backhanded compliment that I have ever received. Piss off to Shaftesbury Avenue. You'll only ever be a star. To Joan, star was a dirty word. I did learn one important thing from her, though. She told me, Rehearsal is the work, performance is the pleasure. This has helped me no end, and for that I am grateful. After theatre workshop, as bad as that was financially, things grew even bleaker. My new agent, Josephine, could just not get my career off the ground. So I went to the last resort of starving actors, a casting agency in St Martin's Lane, near Trafalgar Square run by a man called Ronnie Curtis. Here you sat in the office literally all day long with a large group of other hopefuls and waited for the small studios to ring in and ask for someone to do something the next day for as little money as it was legally possible to pay. As the job did not go through your agent, you saved 10% immediately and as you were there in the first place, Ronnie knew you were desperate and that he could screw you into the ground on the disc, which you had to make on the spot with him in person. My first engagement from Ronnie happened like this. He was very cross-eyed, and so when he came out and pointed at us and said, You, three of us stood up. Then he asked, What size is your chest? We answered in unison with our chest sizes. Who said forty, he asked, and I put my hand up. The other two sat down. What's your inside leg measurement, he demanded. Thirty-two. His eyes lit up. Perfect. Come in beckoning me into his small office. He explained to me that I would be playing a policeman in a small film the next day. I had been cast because I fitted the uniform that the company already had in their wardrobe. I did quite a lot of these little jobs, and they were always at the Merton Park Studios, which specialised in second feature pictures. As rough and as badly paid as these jobs were, they saved the careers of many actors who later turned into stars. In some cases, they would actually save someone's life. There were always five or six suicides a year of actors that I knew personally. So what the number was in all, I hesitate to guess. Believe me, those days were very, very hard. One night, when I was just about as near as I ever got to giving up the business, I phoned Josephine Burton and learned that she'd finally got me a job on television with a good speaking part. The play, she told me, was called The Lark by Jean Anouilly, and it was about the life of Joan of Arc. I was to play the small part of Boudouce the guard who took Joan to Paris to meet the Dauphin. There was one problem, however. I had to become a fully-fledged member of Equity, the British Actors' Trade Union. There was already another actor on Equity's list named Michael Scott, my stage name at the time. Josephine said I must change my last name in the next half hour because she wanted to send the contract off that evening. 
I promised to call her back. I had called her from a phone box in Leicester Square tube station, so I went and sat in Leicester Square, desperately racking my brains. All around were first-run cinemas, and it was as I was looking at the stars' names up in shining lights that I saw the name Humphrey Bogart, one of my all-time favourite actors. The film that he was in at the time was The Cane Mutiny. I looked for a moment and decided that was the one for several reasons. Cain was short and sounded easy with Michael, and it was a word with which everybody was familiar, particularly those of us who had been through the British school system. The word mutiny in the title also appealed to me, because at that time I was extremely rebellious and angry, but I couldn't call myself Michael Mutiny. There was another reason for my choice. Cain was the brother of Abel who was cast out of paradise, and I felt a great sympathy with him at the time. I called Josephine back and told her to put me down as Michael Caine. I was puzzled about how I had landed a responsible part in a prestigious production like this without even meeting the director or anybody else for that matter. And she told me that Julian Amis, who had directed A Hill in Korea, was directing this play and had asked for me. I owe him a debt of gratitude for my first speaking part both in cinema and television. Thank you, Julian, from the bottom of my heart. As the end of the 1950s approached, jobs became even fewer and of less calibre, if that was possible. And I was really despairing when my agent, Josephine Burton, went to New York on business, got appendicitis, went in for an operation, and died when they gave her the anaesthetic. Apart from my personal sadness, since I was really fond of her, her loss was also a terrible professional blow. Now I had no lifeline to work. I did get a new agent quite quickly called Pat Lark, who was a very successful model agent, but her opportunities for actors were less than Josephine, so even that was a retrogressive step. My career finally took off again with a play called One More River, which Sam Wanamaker's theatre company was going to do in Liverpool. Robert Shaw was in the cast, as were several other actors that I knew and liked very much, Dudley Foster, Dudley Sutton and Brian Pringle. The play wasn't a success, but it got me out of London for a couple of months, gave me a bit of money, put me back on stage again after a long absence, and restored my own confidence in my ability, if nobody else's. Although my career did not go zooming into the stratosphere on our return to London, I did get quite a lot of television. The parts were getting bigger and therefore better paid, so although it didn't sound like a lot of work, it did manage to keep me going. In 1959, I was offered a job in a play called The Long and the Short and the Tall by Willis Hall. This was a play about the British Army fighting the Japanese in the jungle in the Second World War. And I was to understudy the role of Private Bamforth, one of the two leading roles. It was also going to be directed by someone I'd very much admired called Lindsay Anderson. The play had been written for Albert Finney, but he had gone down with appendicitis during rehearsal, so the part was taken over by an actor called Peter O'Toole. It was an all-male cast, and two of my old friends were in it, Robert Shaw and Edward Judd, and a new friend, Richard Harris. The play opened and was an instant smash, mainly due to the great cast, especially O'Toole. His performance was magnificent and nearly caused me to have a nervous breakdown during the course of the run. As his understudy, I knew the lines, but I also knew that I could never go on in that part and come even close to his performance. So I used to pray every day that nothing would happen to him. He often used to turn up at the last possible minute with me standing there dressed to go on shaking in my boots. He never ever missed a performance, but I almost had a heart attack some evenings. Once he even came in as the curtain was about to go up and shouted at me, Don't go on, as he ran along the corridor to his dressing room taking his shirt and trousers off as he ran. While O'Toole became a big star and went off to do Lawrence of Arabia, I stayed behind and went out on tour in his role in the long and the short and the tour for the next few months. This was great experience for me. Banforth was a wonderful part, and we had a terrific new director called Anthony Page, who had been Lindsay's assistant on the first production. We toured all over England, Scotland and Ireland, and I learned so much, especially from a marvellous actor called Frank Finlay, who played the other male lead in the play. Frank is not as widely known as he might be, However, when he played Iago to Laurence Olivier's Othello in the theatre, he almost stole over. 
That is the calibre of actor he is. Also in the cast was a shy but very good-looking young actor called Terence Stamp, who came from the same background as me. We hit it off immediately and became firm friends. On my return to London after four months away, I had to find a new place to live. Terry Stamp said there was a room available in a flat he was sharing with ten other guys in Harley Street. A very expensive area, but affordable because there were so many sharing. As I discovered when I moved in, there were twenty-three rooms in all, so nobody got in anybody's way. In 1960, I made contact with another figure whose star was about to rise. He was an actor who I knew vaguely called David Barron, who had decided to give up acting and make playwriting his career. David Barron was only a stage name, he told me. As a playwright, he was going to use his real name, Harold Pinter. The play in which I appeared was a one-act piece called The Room, put on at the Royal Court Theatre in London, along with another one-act play called The Dumb Waiter. My play was a very serious piece and rather obscure. As a matter of fact, I did not understand a word of it. I took my problem to Harold one day and I asked him what the play was about. His reply was, and I quote, How the fucking hell should I know? As my earnings were quite reasonable at that time and Terry Stamp was doing quite well too, we decided that by pooling our resources we could afford to move out of Harley Street which had become more like the YMCA without the swimming pool. The house that we chose was a small one in Ennismore Garden Mews just behind Knightsbridge Tube Station near Harrods. Unfortunately, it only had one bedroom, which created a problem right at the start. What if by chance a young lady should fall victim to our charm and want to pursue that descent to the bedroom? We solved this problem by practising grabbing the mattress and bedclothes to see how fast we could move them onto the front room floor. By the end of the session, we had got the time down to five seconds and managed to do it without unmaking the bed. 1961 started with a bang. I was in a television play called Ring of Truth and then went straight into the two-week run of a play which was written by John McGrath. It was called Why the Chicken. I got to know John McGrath and somehow I was in his office one day and he pointed to a script on his desk that he said was going to be his next television show. At that point, he went out of the room for some reason and I picked up the play and started to read through it. It was not only good, a tense psychodrama, but it was dead right for me. It was called The Compartment and was about two men in a railway carriage on a journey. One is a middle-class snob and the other a vulgar cockney. No prizes for guessing my part. The writer, Johnny Spate, was already famous as the creator of the television series Till Death Do Us Part, which was a comedy and a tremendous hit, and which was adapted in America as All in the Family. The Compartment was his first attempt at drama. In the few minutes that I had to look at this short piece, I knew that it was very powerful. John came back into the office, and I confess that I'd been peeking at the script and begged him for the part. I had never played a lead this big or as difficult on television before, but somehow he got his superiors at the BBC to agree, and I was given the part. My old friend from the tour of The Long and the Short and the Tall, Frank Finley, played the other part, so I had all the help I could want. The play was very well received as far as I was concerned. It proved that I could carry a show and it brought me to the attention of all sorts of people. This was to be of great benefit later on. One day Terry and I were walking along Piccadilly when we saw Roger Moore on the other side of the road. He was already famous in England as the saint and just like everybody else we were thrilled to see someone famous in the flesh. We were standing there gawping at him when he spotted us and came across the road. He stopped right in front of me and said, Is your name Michael Caine? I told him that it was. I saw you in the television play, The Compartment. I just want to tell you that you're going to be a big star. He shook my hand and walked away. That year, 1961, I did five major parts on television thanks to The Compartment. One was a play called Somewhere for the Night by Bill Norton, who four years later, was to write the most important film in my life, Alfie. When Terry Stamp got the starring role in Peter Ustinov's film version of Billy Budd, we finally had enough money to move into a two-bedroom flat in Ebury Street, and my mattress moving skills became redundant forever. I now had a new agent called Dennis Selinger, 
who had taken me on after seeing the compartment. Dennis and I hit it off right from the start and we are friends to this day. He sent me a play from a producer called Michael Codron, a man of great taste and courage and someone I already knew. The play in question was Next Time I'll Sing to You by James Saunders. The deal was £7 a week for two weeks rehearsal and £20 a week for the run, which I thought would be short. It opened at my old stamping ground, the Arts Theatre, and was a big hit with the critics, although the audiences were on the sparse side. However, we managed to stay open long enough for word to get around, and we eventually became such a success that our wages were doubled and we transferred to the Criterion Theatre in Piccadilly. There I was, in the West End at last. I was thirty years old. One night, Stanley Baker, with whom I had worked all those years ago in the Hilling career, came backstage to visit me. By now, he was one of the biggest stars in the British cinema. In the show, I played a cockney, and Stanley explained that he was starring in and producing a film called Zulu, in which there was a cockney character. If I was interested in trying for the part, I'd have to go to see the director, Cy Enfield, in the bar of the Prince of Wales Theatre at ten o'clock the next morning. Cy Enfield was a tubby, slow-speaking, slow-moving, middle-aged American. As he stood up and shook hands, his first words were, I'm sorry to have wasted your time, Michael, but we've already given the part to James Booth. We figured that he looked more like a cockney than you do. I knew Jimmy Booth, who was a very good actor, and I had to agree, he did look more like a cockney than me. This was a terrible disappointment, and the rejection would have floored me at one time but I'd suffered so much of it I just went into my routine defence, which was numb mode. Sorry, kid, he said. That's OK, I smiled. Maybe next time. The bar was very long, and I could not wait to reach the door and get out of there, away from yet another humiliation. I opened the door and was just about to disappear when Sai shouted, Michael, come back here. I walked back. Can you do any other accent but Cockney? When I was in rep, I was doing 50 plays a year using every accent from American gangster to Lord of the Manor. I can do any accent you want. Can you do upper crust English? That's the easiest one of all, I shrugged, hoping desperately that I could remember how to do it. So I stared at me for a while, and then he said, You know, you don't look like a Cockney. You look like one of those snotty, blue-blooded English guys. I looked in the mirror behind the bar. Maybe he was right, I thought. I was six feet two inches tall, very slim, with long blonde hair and blue eyes. Yeah, I was nobody's idea of a typical cockney. In this movie, Sai interrupted my thoughts, there is a character called Gonville Bromhead. He's a very snobbish and aristocratic lieutenant, who thinks that he is superior to everybody, especially the character played by Stanley, who will be here in a minute, he added. Would you mind waiting? I agreed to this instantly and afterwards stood there feigning disinterest while they huddled in a corner, discussing my suitability. Finally, they turned to me and Sai said, Can you do a screen test with Stanley on Friday morning? I walked out of the bar again, but this time with an almighty spring in my step. As I went through the door, I reflected on what would have happened if that bar had been shorter. The screen test took place in the basement of a building in Fleet Street, at that time the headquarters of the British newspaper industry. Cy directed, and Stanley came and did the scenes with me. I was suddenly petrified. Joan Littlewood's advice did not work that day. Fear and panic were the rehearsal, and abject terror the performance. Sai and Stanley could not have been more helpful and patient, and at last we got the take that Sai wanted, and the ordeal was over. I stumbled up the stairs into the daylight, still sweating with fear. I now had to wait the entire weekend before getting the result. Fortunately, I was invited to a party on the Saturday night, and I accepted with the idea of going there and getting absolutely bombed, missing out Sunday altogether, and waking up Monday morning, ready for the result. I walked into the party and the first person I saw was Cy Enfield with his wife. He ignored me. Obviously, the film was not back from the laboratories yet, and he hadn't seen it. I couldn't get bombed 
so I would think I was a drunk and unreliable. So I spent the evening politely sipping beer. Cy was one of the first to leave, and as he went by he caught my eye for the first time and came over. I've seen the test, he said casually. My heart sank. It's the worst one I've ever seen, he added. All over, I thought. But you've got the part, he carried on. We go to South Africa to shoot in three weeks. Congratulations, he shook my hand. Why did you give me the part if the test was so bad? I don't know, Michael, but I have a feeling there's something there. Good night. Fifty-two miles beyond Ladysmith in northern South Africa, we reached the Drakensberg Mountains. Settled in amongst them was a pretty little range of hills shaped like an amphitheatre. Snuggled down in the middle of all this were two hotels and nothing else. Except now, of course, our set. Because here we were going to shoot Zulu. The first scene that I did in the picture was a long shot on a horse. Sai shouted action over the intercom and I set off. All I had to do was walk the horse slowly. What could go wrong, I asked myself. The reply came almost immediately. The horse did not want to go anywhere. Sai shouted for someone to hit the goddamn thing, which the prop man did, and up went the horse and started to do a short impromptu dance on its back legs. Sai's voice came over the air again. Tell him he's supposed to be walking along quietly, not auditioning for the Spanish riding school. The prop man and I pointed the horse along the correct path, which was on the side of a hill, and along we went. The horse and I competed to see who had the nervous breakdown first. As it turned out, it was the horse. He leapt off the path, and carried the two of us up to a twenty-foot dead drop down the hill. The prop man came running down the hill and grabbed the horse before it carried on, and then asked me if I was all right. I wasn't. He told Sai this over the intercom. Sai replied, Can you ride a horse? The prop man said he could. Take his hat and cape and do the shot yourself. It's so far away, no one will know. And so my debut in major motion pictures was not me at all, but a prop man named Ginger. The next day was no better. All I had to do was walk the horse very slowly across the top of a little waterfall, only six or seven feet high. Again, I thought that it would be simple. Today the horse was calm and so was I. We slowly picked our way across the shallow water while the camera panned with us, and as it moved, the metal bits on it started to sparkle and gleam in the sunlight. The horse had never seen anything like this done right into its eyes, so he stood up on his hind legs and I went sprawling into the water. I thought you took riding lessons in London, sighed bawled. I did, I told him. What I didn't add was that the lessons were to take place on Wimbledon Common, but having been thrown in Wimbledon High Street and nearly run over by a bus on the first day, and actually run over by a bicycle when I had been thrown on the second day, I never even reached the Common, although I had learned in Wimbledon High Street on both days that I never wanted to see a horse again. Filming continued without further disaster, and finally the day which we had all been waiting for came. The Zulus arrived. Two thousand of them dressed in their war costume. At dusk they came over the hills from the north and down into our valley. Long lines of magnificent-looking warriors with high headdresses and loincloths of monkey skins and the tails of lions that they had killed themselves with just a spear and their bare hands. As they approached, their deep, booming voices echoed across the mountains, singing in a slow, mournful lament. This was dusk, the time that they would be returning from a battle, and the song was to mourn the dead. As this chant boomed off the side of the hills in slow time, to the beat of two thousand spears hitting two thousand shields, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. The Battle of Rourke's Drift, the subject of the film, was fought by a Welsh regiment, hence Stanley Baker's fascination with the subject. To say that he was Welsh and proud of it would be one of the great understatements of all time. The Victoria Cross is the highest medal for bravery that the British military bestow, and the standard of courage needed to win it is so high that it is very rarely awarded, and most often posthumously. 
The extraordinary feature of this battle is that it was fought with such exemplary valour that eleven Victoria Crosses were awarded in one day, a situation unique in British military history. The man who played the chief of the Zulus in the film is the real-life chief today, Chief Butelezi, the present-day leader of the Inkata movement. A woman who I think was his sister, a princess of the tribe anyway, was the tribal historian. The Zulus have no written history. Everything is passed down verbally, and this woman seemed to know every detail of the battle that we were filming. Sai said that she drew in the sand with a stick the movement of the Zulu armies and their battle formations in such detail that he used them in the film exactly as she had said to great effect. They are some of the best battle scenes I have ever seen in a film. Eventually, the first rushes of my work arrived back at the set. Rushes are the bits of film of just a day's work that are rushed back for you to look at to see if everything turned out all right on the screen. Because we were in South Africa and the film had to be processed in the laboratories in England, there was a two-week delay before anybody saw my first work actually on a screen. Seeing the rushes is a big test for new actors. The stakes are high now, in my case particularly so, since for all these years I had maintained that all I needed was a real chance on the big screen and then I would show everybody not only that I could act well, but also that I had that indefinable something, star quality. I sat there in a very cool room with the sweat of anxiety pouring down my back as the place filled up to standing room only. Suddenly, the lights went out without warning. And the first thing I learned is that, on these occasions, the technicians forget the actors are there and speak honestly about them, which is quite an experience. The screen lit up and a ghastly face appeared and started to speak in a terrible voice. I sat there for an instant and wondered who the hell this was. And to my horror, it was me. Behind me a voice said, Who let the silly bastard wear his hat pulled down like that? You can't see his fucking eyes. In the film I wore an old-fashioned military pith helmet with a small peak on the front to protect the wearer's eyes from the sun. I had decided to use this as part of my characterization. I would say some of the lines with my eyes in the shade, and when I wanted to make a strong point, I would tip my head back slightly and catch the full glare of the sun in my eyes. This had been worked out with great skill, I thought, and here was someone misunderstanding and calling me a silly bastard into the bargain. Ah, oh, sod it, I thought. What's it matter? At this point, I threw up all over my best costume trousers and boots and fled from the room. I didn't have to work the next day, so I spent a tense time waiting for the evening to come and the unit to return. I decided to make it easy for Stanley or Si to fire me, so I stood at the corner of the bar where they would have to walk right by me as they came into the hotel. I took up my position, had a couple of quick drinks to deaden the pain, and I waited. Eventually, Si and Stanley came in. Stanley caught my eye first and said, Not bad, kid, but you'll get better. And they both walked on. When I first started to work on the character of Bromhead, the most important facet of the man seemed to be the fact that he came from a privileged background. Not having one myself, I studied people who had, and I picked on Prince Philip and watched his mannerisms whenever I got the chance. The thing that I noticed about him was that he always walked with his hands behind his back. The psychology of this, I figured, was that he was a powerful man and well guarded, so he did not have to be ready to defend himself as the unguarded lower orders do. He never had to open doors or do other mundane things for himself. He didn't have to wave his hands about during conversation in order to attract attention. He was a good piece of characterization, I thought, and played the part with my hands behind my back at every opportunity. One day, I was walking past the production office when one of the secretaries put her head out of the window and beckoned me in. She was a very pretty girl and I had fancied her for some time. Was this my chance? I walked into her office and she thrust a telegram in my hand. Read this, she whispered, before anybody comes back. It was addressed to Stanley and it was from a senior Paramount executive in London. Actor playing Bromhead, so bad 
doesn't even know what to do with hands, it said. Every shot seen here so far, hands behind back, suggest you replace him. I spent two more days of agony waiting for Stanley to fire me. Everywhere he went he would suddenly find me standing in front of him to give him his opportunity. I could not tell him that I had seen a confidential telegram or I'd get the secretary into trouble. Finally, I invented a cock and bull story of how I had found the telegram on the floor and picked it up and put it back on his desk and happened to read it in the process. I know you've been told to replace me. I just want to thank you and let you know that I understand your position and it's okay. I don't mind going now, I blurted out in one long breath. He stood and stared at me. Who is the producer of this movie, he finally asked. You asked then. Have I said that you were fired? No, I mumbled. Well, get on with your job, he said, and walked away. Then he turned and said, And stop reading my fucking mail or you will get fired. At last the weeks of agony and doubt were over. I knew that for better or for worse, I had the part, and that was that. The weeks went by, and although the work was fascinating... The evenings were long and miserable, with absolutely nothing to do. There were very few women on the unit and masses of men, so for the majority of us there was no romance or even sex to take our mind off things. One evening I was sitting at the bar having a drink with Stan when I mentioned how boring the evenings were here, and he gave me a typical baker piece of advice. If you've got dialogue the next day, go to bed. If you haven't, get pissed. So I did. In due course, the film was finished, so we all got drunk as skunks and set off back to London. I was so homesick for my beloved city that I could taste it. As the plane took off from Johannesburg Airport, there was a loud cheer and I sat there, so happy that I almost cried. I was going home at last and I had made my first real film. Would my luck hold, I wondered. It did. It held very nicely, thank you. Sulu was a great success and it gave my career the sort of boost that I had almost given up dreaming about. One evening I was in the Pickwick Club having dinner with Terry Stamp when a waiter came over and asked me if I would join a gentleman at an adjacent table for a moment. I looked over and saw at once that it was Harry Saltzman who, together with Cubby Broccoli, was responsible for the fabulously successful James Bond series. I went over and introduced myself and Harry invited me to join his party for a few moments. We have just come from seeing Zulu, his wife said, and this was followed by many gratifying compliments, ending with one crucial phrase that nobody had ever said to me before. Harry announced, We all agreed that you could be a big star. You really came over well on the screen. I blushed. My heart beat faster. Somebody had said it at last. And it was somebody who knew what he was talking about. Have you read a book by Len Dayton called The Ipcress File? Harry remarked. As it happened, I was halfway through it. I told him so. I'm going to make a film of it. Would you like to play the lead? Yes, I said, trying to look as though people made offers like this to me every day. Yes, I repeated, trying to control the wonder in my voice. And would you like a seven-year contract with my company? I gave the same answer with less control. Would you like to have lunch with me at Les Ambassadeurs tomorrow? Yes, I replied, hoping that he was not finding my conversation rather monotonous. One o'clock then. He shook my hand. I was dismissed. I stumbled back to Terry. What happened? I've got a starring role in a movie in a seven-year contract. You've only been gone two minutes, he said. I got to know my new boss very well. I also got to know his wife and children. Jacqueline Saltzman was a very attractive and vivacious woman, aged about 40 at the time. And as she was a Romanian from Paris and did not speak English very well, my French was very much put to the test. Harry had a large country mansion in Buckingham this year, and it was here that I started to spend every Sunday evening. Our first problem with it, Chris, was the fact that the book had been written in the first person and the narrator had no name. One evening we were sitting around discussing this when Harry said this spy was to be the antithesis of James Bond, a very ordinary bloke, someone who could mingle unnoticed in a crowd and who should have an ordinary boring name. 
What's the dullest first name we can give him, asked Harry. Charlie Cashier, his partner on this film, myself, and a couple of other people sat there, meditating about this for a while, and then, without thinking, I blurted out, Harry is a pretty dull name. All eyes turned to Harry, who, for all his friendship and kindness, had a ferocious temper. He stared straight at me for a moment and then started to laugh. Let's call him Harry then, he said. My real name's Herschel. Audible sighs of relief hissed round the room as the danger passed. Now we needed a surname. We all started to go through the dullest names we could think of, Smith, Brown, Jones, etc. None of them felt right. Finally, Harry said, the dullest person I ever met was called Palmer. So that was it. The character was christened Harry Palmer. It was during one of these Sunday night sessions that Harry hit on another idea for the character. I'm short-sighted in real life and always wear glasses. During the meal, Harry kept staring at me and finally remarked, I always hate it in films when actors who do not normally wear glasses are made to wear them and don't know how to handle them. You, he said to me, know exactly what to do with them. So why don't we have Harry with some in the new film? He will also help to make the guy look more ordinary. Remember, Harry was the co-producer of the Bond series at that time with Cubby Broccoli. And as Zip Chris was his own production, he wanted to get away as far as possible from the Bond image. So we decided to have Harry Palmer shopping in a supermarket and pushing his own trolley full of groceries. Here was territory that Bond, brave though he was, would never have dared to tread. At this point, one or two of the fainter hearts started to demur. Maybe we were making this Palmer guy just a bit too much of a wimp. But Harry told us not to worry. He would have Palmer fighting a duel with his boss using the trolleys as weapons. I sat there listening to all this and worrying about the direction the project was taking in comparison with Bond. The latter had several million dollars worth of special effects, a great name and a number, 007, as well as a license to kill. And here I was, winding up with glasses, a battle with supermarket trolleys, and the dullest name that anyone could think of. The director of it press was Sidney Fury. He and Harry had a lot of rows, with Harry's temper living up to its reputation. The climax came one day when we were on location in Shepherd's Bush then a run-down area of West London. The first I knew of it was when Sid came running round a street corner and almost knocked me flying. To my astonishment, I saw that he was crying. He stared at me for a moment and then screamed through his tears, Fuck it! I'm off this picture! And with one bound, jumped onto a number 12 bus that was just pulling away from its stop. Shortly afterwards, Harry came charging round the same corner. Where's he gone? Down the Bayswater Road on a number 12 bus. Nobody leaves my set on a fucking bus, he bellowed. His enormous Phantom 5 Rolls Royce was brought up. We both piled in and the chase was on. We caught up with the bus and stayed close behind it, waiting for it to stop. Meanwhile, the bus conductor, who was standing on the platform at the back, was watching all this with great interest. Not the least, because the car we were in was exactly the same one used by Her Majesty the Queen on state occasions. He was peering intently into the car when Harry leaned out of the window and yelled at him, Stop the fucking bus. You've got our director on board. You could see it suddenly occur to the conductor that maybe Her Majesty was not in our car, but he still stopped the bus at the next stop. Harry and I boarded it, and after a fortnight ride to Marble Arch, we managed to persuade Sid to come back and finish the film. I had now been earning £10,000 a week for 15 weeks, a situation which for me, and I'm sure anyone else from my background, was beyond belief. It was time to find a home of my own. Terry had done enough for me by paying my way when I was down, so I now decided to relieve him of any further responsibility. I leased a small muse flat in Albion Close just behind Marble Arch. I bought the biggest colour television I could find and put one in every room, including the bathroom. I also purchased the best and the loudest hi-fi I could locate and taped that through every room. I filled the fridge and pantry with food acquired all the latest records and greatest luxury of all. I bought books, hundreds of them. I selected a load of clothes for all occasions from my great friend Doug Haywood and bought shirts to match from Turnbull and Asser. The measurements for the shirts, I was informed, 
could be taken at home in the evening if I was too busy in the daytime. I was busy, I told them, and they said that Mr. Michael would be with me at seven o'clock that evening. The clock struck seven, the doorbell went, and when I opened the door, I was astonished to find a thirty-year-old boy scout, complete with short trousers and a staff, smiling at me. I'm Mr. Michael, he announced. I'm on my way to a scout meeting. I've just popped by to measure you for your shirts. So there I was, able at last to afford shirts made by the most expensive shirt maker in England, only to have my measurements taken by a boy scout. Things never turn out quite like they should, do they? The director, Lewis Gilbert, saw a rough cut of it, Chris, and offered me the part of Alfie in the film of the same name. Ironically, I had earlier auditioned for the part in the play on which the film was based and failed to get it. Even more ironically, Terence Stamp had been offered the film role and I had urged him to take it. He had been in the play in America, however, and it had flopped, so he wanted no more to do with it. I reached page two of the script, stopped reading and phoned Lewis and told him I'd do it. Although I'd seen it on the stage, it was a long time ago now, and I had forgotten just how brilliant the dialogue was. When I mentioned this to Bill Norton, he told me that the dialogue had had to be good, since it had started out as a radio play called Alfie Elkins and His Little Life. The very first Alfie was Bill Owen, who was now famous on British television in a series called Last of the Summer Wine. Another unusual thing about Elfie was the author himself. When you think of the subject and the hero, you would expect him to be a young swinger, but in actual fact, Bill Norton was even then pushing 60. I had, of course, done another play of Bill's on television several years before, somewhere for the night. That was very good, but Alfie was much, much better. I took an instant liking to Lewis Gilbert. He was a quiet, sincere man who loved actors, and I felt a kindred spirit with him. He too comes from a similar background of working-class London, with a mother who worked, but in a different job from my mother's. Mrs. Gilbert was a film extra. I worked with her many times subsequently, and on one occasion she informed me proudly that she was the mother of Lewis Gilbert, who had directed me in Alfie. A new experience for me was acting with a Hollywood name, and the name was Shelley Winters. She came thundering down a corridor of the Dorchester Hotel in London where we were shooting on a location scene. It was eight o'clock on a Monday morning and I decided to introduce myself, which I did, and she said, Let's do it before we go into makeup. Otherwise we'll have to get made up again. Do what? Screw, she replied to my amazement. I always like to screw the leading man on the first day and get it out of the way because it can interfere with the performance sometimes. I stood there for a moment with my mouth agape trying to reply, but for once speechless. And then I fled, her laughter echoing down the corridor behind me. Filming went smoothly, too smoothly, in fact. I was sailing through the scenes with all the confidence of a Spencer Tracy. Suddenly, in came an actor called Denham Elliott as the abortionist, and he started to act me off the screen. Socks were pulled up and shoulders put to the wheel to combat this extremely charming new menace but to no avail. I never ever managed to top him. I only just managed to hold my own, in fact. One day, when the film was finished awaiting its release date, I had lunch with Lewis, and while we were eating and talking, he very calmly dropped into the conversation a thought that had my head reeling. I think you will get nominated for an Academy Award for this one, he said calmly, as if discussing the weather. This was Lewis's way of doing things. I didn't believe it, of course, but the mere fact that someone like him thought enough of my performance to even mention it in the same breath was an unexpected compliment indeed. The film was finished, and all I had to do was sit and wait for the verdict. Meanwhile, it was out of the fantasy land of film and back to that true realm of make-believe, the sixties. It was 1966, at least I think it was, but as someone once said, anyone who can remember the 60s was not in London at the time. The Beatles released their songs Paperback Writer and Yellow Submarine. Frank Sinatra was a stranger in the night while his daughter was assuring us that these boots were made for walking. The Rolling Stones sang Paint It Black. 
Julie Christie had a big hit in John Schlesinger's film Darling. Vanessa Redgrave was in Carol Rice's Morgan, a suitable case for treatment, and just made the lovely film Georgie Girl with James Mason. Sean Connery had a massive hit with Thunderball and was following it up with You Only Live Twice. Peter Sellers was wildly funny as Inspector Clouseau in the Pink Panther films and is shot in the dark. Stanley Kubrick offered us Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. A title that was strangely symptomatic of the 60s as the threats of nuclear oblivion came and went with monotonous regularity. In the midst of all this came the premiere of The Ipcris File. It was not a true big movie premiere, but opened on a Thursday night at the Leicester Square Theatre. The public was allowed in all parts of the auditorium, except for the front two rows of the circle, which were reserved for those of us who made the picture. Harry Saltzman and I slipped out just before the end to stand in the lobby and eavesdrop on what the public said as they came out. The first man to emerge spotted me immediately and came right over to us. Were you the bloke in that film? Yes. It was the biggest load of crap I've ever seen. He stormed off. People stared at us as though we were criminals, and we stared back as we course we were, if it was that bad. Next morning, I woke not with a start, but a tremor of fear. I showered slowly and dressed with the movements of a condemned man. I went round to the newsstand, bought all the papers, and took them home. As if to confirm Armageddon, the first review that I read was a stinker. My future sank over the horizon. But miraculously, the next one was good, and my future started to dawn again almost immediately. The one after that was marvellous, as was the next, and the next, and the next. I suddenly found myself sobbing uncontrollably, and screwing up each review into a ball after I'd read it, and throwing them out of the window down into the street below, as the years of stress, anger, and pent-up frustration started to flow out of me in the form of tears, over my face and down to the floor, where I stamped them into the carpet and oblivion forever. How long I stood there doing this I have no idea, but suddenly I became aware of someone watching me. I looked down into the mews, and there was an old child lady from one of the houses standing looking up at me. You'd better come down here, my lad, and pick this lot up, she said. What are you crying for, anyway? A man your age. It's time you grew up. I went down and picked up the paper, and from that day on, I grew up, as she suggested. I'd made it at last, and life was never going to be the same again, thank God. I was thirty-two years old. That was what happened in 1966. The next date I'm going to mention is 1973. So what happened in between? If you want all the details, you must buy my book in which everything is written down. Everything. But you don't get the voice. So you pay your money and you take your pick. Now, where was I? What happened between 1966 and 1973? In a nutshell, my feet never touched the ground. I made 14 movies, some of which were good and some of them were not. I worked in America, Germany, Finland, France, Spain, Italy, Austria and the Philippines, and very occasionally in England. And the reason for this amazing and rewarding and exhausting roller coaster of perpetual motion was the success which attended Ipcress and Elfie, not just in England, but in America, and consequently all over the rest of the world. My success was cultural as well as popular. Witness the fact that I was asked to film Sleuth with Sir Laurence Olivier, directed by Joe Mankiewicz. This honour was not without its disadvantages. Laurence Olivier had been the foremost star and director in the theatre for many, many years. He had worked in an atmosphere of extraordinary power, where the job of everyone around him had always been, other actors included, to get the great man's performance on the stage. I found myself suddenly in a very tricky situation. He would place himself in the best possible location for a scene, and then leave me somehow to act around him. If I had a line that interfered with one of his moves, he would just tell the director to cut it. Eventually, I went to Joe Mankiewicz and told him of my problem, as if he hadn't noticed, and he said, I'll look after you. Every time Larry has suggested that I cut one of your lines, I promised I will cut it in the editing. This was true, I remembered. But then I said, 
Did you see the two shot this morning, which was supposed to be a 50-50? He went upstage and pulled me around until you could only see the side of my face. I saw that, Joe said sympathetically. The next time he does it, turn right around until your back is to the camera and I will come in over his shoulder from the other side for a close-up on you. You'll soon stop it, he smiled. Don't worry, Michael. This isn't the theatre. We do have editing and close-ups. I returned to the fray with my confidence boosted and a very valuable new trick that I have used to great advantage ever since. A couple more days shooting passed and we gradually came to work more as a team until finally I had my most difficult scene in the picture in which Olivier's character holds a gun to my head and tells me that he is going to shoot me and I have to break down in hysterics and cry for mercy. We did this scene and it went very well for me and as we were walking back to our dressing rooms Larry put his arm round my shoulder and whispered softly in my ear. When we started on this film I thought of you as a very skilled assistant. He gave one of his little dramatic pauses and then added, I now see that I have a partner. We reached my dressing room door first. He just kissed me on the cheek and continued on to his. From that day our friendship was sealed and truly did create a partnership that was very good for the film and also made my life so much easier. My first reaction to my improved circumstances was to buy my mother a big house in the South London suburb called Streatham. I split it into flats so that various relatives could move in with her. What day does the rent man come, she asked. I told her there was no rent man, that she was the owner. I then bought myself a house, a beautiful 200-year-old water mill in Clure, a little village just outside Windsor. It was there that I first took up gardening. At the time, I, I looked upon it as possibly a better hobby than drinking several bottles of vodka a day. Since then, it has become one of the passions of my life, and without a doubt, it knocks drinking vodka into a cocked hat. The next thing that happened was that I fell in love with the most wonderful girl. The way it happened was another of those strokes of luck which persuades me that there is a God in heaven. Late one evening in my flat, I was watching television with my old friend Paul Challen. My attention was caught by a Maxwell House coffee advert that had been shot in Brazil. On the screen, a Brazilian girl was dancing, holding up maracas filled with coffee beans. Apparently, they not only tasted good, but sounded good as well. The girl was dancing in a long shot, but there was something about her that made me hope there would be a close-up before the commercial ended. As if the director had read my mind, there it was close-up of the most beautiful girl I had ever seen. The effect on me was extraordinary. The palms of my hands were beginning to sweat, and I found myself down on my knees in front of the set, trying to get a closer look at this vision, only to be confronted with the Maxwell House coffee jar. What's the matter with you, Paul said. That girl, she's beautiful. So what? I want to meet her. How can you meet her? She's in Brazil. Then that's where I'm going. You want to come? When? Tomorrow. Paul said, I'm all for a trip to Brazil, but I think you're fucking mad. Later that night, sleep was out of the question. We were sitting in Tramp at my favourite night spot with Johnny Gold, one of the owners. Above the din of the disco, I screamed my story of newfound love into his tolerant ear. A guy called Nigel Pulitzer came in and expressed surprise at seeing me sitting there with Johnny and Paul and no girl. I'm in love, I told him. Who with? I told him about the Maxwell House commercial. To my amazement, he said, The one with the maracas? How on earth did you guess that? I worked for the company that made the commercial. I couldn't believe my luck. Paul and I are going to Brazil tomorrow to find her, I told him. Nigel said, She's not in Brazil. So where is she? In Fulham, he said, which was about a mile from where we were sitting. To cut a long story short, he introduced me to Shakira Bax soon afterwards. We got to know each other, fell in love and got married. Thanks to Shakira, the good life became infinitely better. And that has been the pattern ever since. Which takes me to 1973. Because that was the year when our daughter Natasha was born. 
Every three or four months all through our marriage, Shakira and I have spent many honeymoons in Paris, usually over a long weekend. It's always the same, very simple and completely sybaritic. We eat in all the best restaurants, stay in a luxury hotel, dance all night and sleep all day, and spend all our time just with each other, and that's it. This particular time we were staying in the Hotel Georges Sank. As I sat up in bed having my first coffee of the day, the phone went and a voice asked, Is that Michael Caine? Yes. This is John Houston. I nearly dropped the phone. Here I was, speaking to the one director whom I actually idolised. Yes, Mr. Houston. Call me John. I'm in the Hotel Prince de Gaulle next door to you. Could you come over and see me for a few minutes this morning? Yes, I'll be there in ten minutes. That will be just fine. I'll be in the bar, he said, and rang off. As I entered the bar, a voice called, Over here, Michael. And there he was at the counter, a cigar in one hand and a glass of vodka in the other. He had white hair and a white beard separated by smiling blue eyes that looked as though they had seen it all and decided that it was okay anyway. He looked like God after a bad night and after I heard his voice in real life for the first time. I always thought if ever I heard God speak, that was exactly how he would sound. What do you have, he said. It was too early, really, but I thought, what the hell? I'm never going to meet John Houston for the first time again. A large vodka, I said nonchalantly. And so began a friendship that was to last until his death a few years ago. My vodka came, we touched glasses without a word and both down to slug. Now let me tell you what this is all about, he said, settling himself comfortably on the bar. For twenty years now, I've been trying to make a film of a short story by Rudyard Kipling called The Man Who Would Be King. I had it all set up at one time a couple of years ago. As a matter of fact, I was sitting in this very bar when I brought together the two stars I was going to use. He paused and took a swig of vodka. I couldn't resist. Who were they? Clark Gable and Humphrey Bogart, he replied with a smile. We had it all set up and then they both went and died on me. And what's more, it would have been the first time that they had worked together, he added wistfully. I waited for a while to see where I was going to figure in this. Finally, he said, we have now got the backing for the movie, and I want you to play a character called Peachy Carnahan. I found myself blurting out, what part was Bogart going to play? Peachy Carnahan, John replied. I'll do it. Don't you want to read the script? With you directing a story by Rudyard Kipling and a part that Bogart was going to play, how can I lose? I hope you're right, he said laconically. Do you know the story? No, I said. Well, read it. It's very short. The other leading character, their best friends in the movie, is called Daniel Dravet, the part Gable was going to play. Who do you want to play that? Sean Connery. I remembered how, as a boy, my impossible dream had been to become an actor. In a Houston film I had seen called The Treasure of Sierra Madre, a bunch of misfits were looking for gold, which was their impossible dream. And in it I had identified with the Bogart character, the nobody trying to become a somebody. That was me. Now here I was playing a part that was meant for Bogart. In this story, Peachy and Danny were two British army sergeants in India who set out on their own quest to become the kings of an ancient realm of fabulous wealth called Kafiristan. I was doing the impossible dream, making a film with Houston, about an impossible dream, and it was all coming true. The man who would be king was shot in Morocco, and our base was a beautiful old French colonial hotel called the Mamounia in Marrakesh. This was a favourite hotel of Winston Churchill, and I was put in the suite that he always used. Much to my surprise, it was a very modest suite, but very comfortable, and with a great view over the hotel gardens towards the Atlas Mountains. To cap it all, there was a painting on the wall by Winston of the view out of the window, and from what I could see, it hadn't changed a bit since he'd painted it. 
The night before we started shooting, we were all having dinner in the hotel dining room when John Houston dropped the bombshell that the girl who was to play the part of the beautiful Indian princess was no longer available. The question was, where could we find someone at such short notice to play the part? Shakira, who is a Kashmiri Indian, was sitting there innocently eating her dinner. She suddenly looked up to find us all staring at her. She cottoned on immediately and said very firmly, I am not going to play the part. John put on his most charming smile, winked at me, and said, We'll talk about it in the morning, honey. And we all continued eating. The next day, Shakira came out to the location to watch the start of shooting. During the course of the morning, John had a moment free, and he took her aside for a while, and they both came back all smiles. John announced that Shakira had agreed to be our Princess Roxanne. I was very surprised at this, because... I'd spent the night before trying to talk her into playing it, but with no success. The old charmer, however, had done it again. John did what very few directors ever do with actors. He left you alone to get on with it until he saw a basic flaw. And then he had that rare ability to put you back on the right track with the minimum of words and fuss. For instance, I was doing a long speech on the second day when suddenly he stopped the take. What's wrong, John? I asked, and he replied, You can speak faster, Peachy. He's an honest man. With that one sentence, he had explained my character in a nutshell. You will also notice that he called me Peachy and not Michael. Once we started to play the parts, John only ever addressed Sean and myself as Daniel and Peachy. This lasted all through the film and for months after it. The only other time he stopped me on a take was in a scene with Christopher Plummer, who was playing Kipling. I had to tell him of our plans, and his reply was that it was very dangerous. In response to this, I had the line, We are not little men, which I said with the accent on the word not. John cut the shot and asked me to say the line with the accent on the word little. I did it his way, and when we cut the shot, I looked over at him. He was smiling, the inference being obvious that we were all big men around here. And it was true. We all seemed to increase in stature as we worked with him. Shakira was a little nervous when the time came for her to start work. I, on the other hand, was so concerned for her that John barred me from the set on the days that she worked in the scenes in which I did not appear with her. I need not have worried. Working with John, she came out of the whole thing looking absolutely marvellous and, what is more important, very real. There was one difficult scene that she had to do that I knew John had improvised. The day before, we had shot a scene with some Berber women dancing, and one of them had suddenly gone into a cross between a fit and a trance. He obviously picked up on this and had Shakira's character do the same thing. It was a difficult scene, even for a professional actress, but with John's help, it turned out fine. I was very proud of her. When she had finished her part, I asked Shakira if she would like to become a professional actress? The answer was a very firm no. There was from this, however, a very important benefit to our marriage. My wife had now done my job and knew what pressures and stress were part and parcel of it. So now when I do come home from the set a bit exhausted, she does know why and what I'm talking about. Working with Sean Connery was an absolute joy for me. I had rarely worked with any actor who was so unselfish and generous, so much so that you could experiment and take chances and not expect to find a knife in your back if it went wrong. It is rare to do a long dialogue scene in a film where your fellow actor will turn you full face to the camera for your important line and you return the compliment. But this is what Sean and I did with complete ease all through the film. And I like to think that our personal relationship and trust came through on the screen and helped the picture. Sean is also the consummate professional, which is the highest compliment that I can pay him. We did all sorts of improvisations, which are less easy in films than in the theatre because of the technology involved. But it was all done in a completely relaxed atmosphere, because John trusted us and we trusted each other. The scene in the picture where we march in and are given a sharp rebuke for our behaviour by the governor of the province was completely unscripted and improvised on the set by Sean and myself a little scene of which we are both very proud.
The last scene we shot in The Man Who Would Be King was the one in which the religious sect who have captured us execute Sean by making him stand in the middle of a rope bridge over a deep ravine and cutting the ropes to send him plunging to his death hundreds of feet below. The bridge was a very unstable affair, handmade by the locals, and I had come there the day before with Sean to have a look at it. I would only managed to get a little way out on the swaying bridge before Vertigo overtook me, and I retreated to the safety of the top of the ravine. Sean had gone out further than me, but even he didn't manage to get right to the middle. So finally, there we were, ready to shoot the scene. There was a long silence as we all surveyed the swaying and suddenly flimsy-looking structure. This silence was broken by Sean. I was here yesterday and the bridge looked okay, he said with some trepidation. But today it seems to be leaning over to the right. John looked at Sean for a moment, a twinkle in his eye. The bridge is exactly as it was yesterday, Sean, he said. The difference today is that you have to walk off on it. So you're looking at it from a different point of view. Sean glanced at John for a moment, accepted the challenge in his eyes, and without a moment's hesitation, walked straight out to the middle of the bridge. In this scene, Sean was to sing as the priests cut the rope, and this he did as the first phony ropes were cut, and then he came off the bridge visibly relieved. His place was taken by a wonderful British stuntman called Joe Powell, who was going to do the actual drop when the ropes were cut. I looked over the edge of the ravine, and a couple of hundred feet below I could see a mound of boxes and mattresses that were to break his fall. It looked about the size of a postage stamp. With the wind blowing and the bridge swaying as the axes cut the real ropes holding it, we all stood there watching, frozen with nerves as it dawned on us that to leap off this moving platform and hit the target so far below was an almost impossible task. The final rope split, the bridge collapsed, and down Joe went, hurtling towards the jagged rocks below, manoeuvring himself all the time as he plummeted and as the wind tried to drag him onto the rocks. At the very last minute he straightened himself out and hit the centre of the mattresses. An audible sigh of relief went up, immediately followed by a great cheer as we saw Joe get up uninjured and make his way towards his assistance at the side of the mattresses. John was not an impressionable man, nor one given to easy compliments, but at that moment he turned to me and said, That is the darndest stunt I ever saw. The film was finished, and I instantly felt a tremendous pride that I had been in it. And I was right. The Man Who Would Be King is one of the finest films in which I have ever appeared, and one that I think will last long, long, long after I am gone. In other words, a classic. Thank you, John. The most glorious summer I ever spent in all the years that I owned the mill house at Clure was in 1976. Shakira and I were more deeply in love than ever. Our five-year-old daughter Natasha was beautiful, bright and healthy. The temperature was 110 degrees on the centre court at Wimbledon, and I had got a movie in England on location in a place called Maple Durham, an even more beautiful spot on the River Thames than my own, and just 15 minutes upriver. I remember in particular one wonderful hot afternoon in our garden, with the sky so clear there seemed nothing between us and heaven. Our dearest friends were gathered there for Sunday lunch, Roger and Louisa Moore, Brian and Annette Forbes, and of course Dennis Sullinger and others. I could not imagine a moment as perfect as this, it was that Sunday afternoon as if no cloud could ever pass over us. In the cold, clear light of Monday morning, however, everything looked different, especially when my accountant wanted to see me on an urgent matter. The sum total of our lunch together was that I must cut my standard of living drastically, die penniless or sell up everything and leave England. I thought about dying penniless for a while, but rejected it as an option. Lowering my standard of living I had to reject because I couldn't think of any way of telling Shakira. I was left with the last sad resort. I decided to leave England. Our Labour government of the time, it seemed, was not bothered with super tax as an economic tool, as the majority of people who were required to pay it had already left the country. So they were actually collecting less tax from the rich than the Conservatives had with their much lower taxes. 
So what was their motive if it was fiscally unsound? The answer came when I saw a socialist minister on television making a speech in which he said the rich were going to be taxed until they screamed. I concluded that we were not talking about economics here but emotion and that particular emotion, envy, is not a good basis for government. These punitive taxes, 82% in my case, proved a tragedy for Britain because of all the talented, ambitious people who left, the trained, the skilled, the best and the brightest. I come from the poorer classes of my country and I have an understanding and God knows a sympathy with their problems. I agree that we high earners should all pay taxes to help the less fortunate and build a just and equal society. I also agree that the super rich should be taxed more heavily than ordinary earners but not to the extent of bankrupting or exiling those people most likely to pay these taxes. I just hope my timing as an actor is better than the way I time my personal decisions. It was the 3rd of January 1979 and we were flying to New York on our way to Los Angeles. With my normal shrewd intelligence and impeccable timing, I had just lived through the last 16 most lucrative years of my life under one of the most brutal taxation systems in the world and was now jetting off just as a conservative government was about to be elected and remain in power for the next 18 years at least. I had sold the mill house to Jimmy Page of the rock group Led Zeppelin for three quarters of a million pounds and had a hundred thousand pounds left in the bank after making a down payment on my new home in Los Angeles which had a mortgage of a million dollars. I was in actual fact broke as far as cash was concerned, a refugee from my own beloved country. Now if I had been lazy or unsuccessful, this might have been understandable, but I had worked hard and enjoyed enormous success for 16 years. I had earned at least 20 million pounds, but the British tax system had destroyed me and I was forced to start all over again. For the first year of my exile, I was not allowed to set foot in Britain. After that, the ration was 90 days a year. Before I arrived in Hollywood, I had been told that the people there were false, artificial and ruthless. How can it be, then, that in all the time I spent there, I only encountered charm, sincerity and warmth? For a while I thought our ready entree into this agreeable society was down to my own charm and wit, but it was not so. The real reason was simple. Shakira. Here was a woman of incredible beauty whose equally lovely nature did not go unnoticed especially by the wives of Hollywood. And she was accepted even more readily than I was. I first noticed this when she started being invited to women-only lunches by the wives of men who didn't even deign to speak to me. Shakira absolutely loved Beverly Hills and the feelings were reciprocated. I had never ever seen her so happy and of course I was delighted for her. For myself, I liked it very much and I only had the occasional twinge of homesickness. As for Natasha, she settled in very quickly. She loved her school and made a great friend immediately, which was lucky for all of us. This was a great little American girl and her name was Stacy. These two are close friends to this day. So there we were, and I set about earning a crust. Among the films I made were California Suite, The Swarm, Beyond the Poseidon Adventure, The Island, Dress to Kill, and The Hand. The most interesting of these were Dress to Kill, directed by Brian De Palma. My role was somewhat bizarre and a very big departure for me. I was a transvestite psychiatrist murderer. Not a lot of laughs, but just the sort of good role that a British actor could get his teeth into, as none of the big Hollywood stars would accept it through fear of damaging their images. De Palma, I thought, was one of the greatest directors, technically, that I had ever worked with. We had now been in our new home for three years and were settled in sufficiently to have my mother out for a holiday. I picked her up at the airport and on the way back to the house she stared out of the window fascinated by everything. She had hardly travelled overseas before. As we progressed through the mundane suburbs of LA then swung into the more lush vegetation of the Beverly Hills gardens my mother was amazed at the amount of flowers and plants and the fact that there were leaves on the trees. It was winter in England of course and all the plants were bare. What do you think of it Ma? I asked. The gardens are so lovely, she said, pointing out of the car window. Look at all that hysteria growing up the walls. Innocently and with a misused word, 
she had hit the nail right on the head. It wasn't long before she decided that she wanted to go back to England as she had missed three episodes of some TV soap opera she had been following and didn't want to lose the thread of the story. We all have our priorities, and this was hers. So off she went back to Streatham. The first thing any English person does who is homesick anywhere in the world is to start buying British newspapers. In due course, buying and reading them became a new and important part of my life. The second thing a homesick Brit does is to buy shortwave radio and spend hours fiddling with the tuner to get a very scratchy sound of a voice from London on the world service of the BBC. I got very good at it. The third source of comfort for any homesick Brit in the United States is to stay up every Sunday night and watch Masterpiece Theatre and Mystery on the public television station because these programmes are always British. At this time it was upstairs downstairs and the mystery was Lord Peter Wimsey's series. These two programmes could bring tears of nostalgia to my eyes when I lived in England, so the effect in Los Angeles every Sunday was devastating. So there you have it, the homesick Brit's survival kit. Ironically, considering the emotional signals I was registering, at about that period I became a sort of British social ambassador whenever royalty or the aristocracy came to visit us. I gave a dinner for Princess Michael of Kent at Morton's, a new restaurant and fashionable rendezvous opened by Peter Morton. Peter is an American whom I had known in London, where he had opened the Hard Rock Café. Princess Margaret came to visit us, and my American agent, Sue Mingers, got chosen to host the party for the princess at her home. This was a great source of pride for Sue, who adores the British royal family. She was one of the toughest agents in Hollywood, but when the time came to meet the princess at the door of her home, she almost collapsed with fright, but was ushered through the niceties of the meeting by her French husband, John Claude. He was as impressed as she was, but, like all the French, he would die rather than show it. I already knew Princess Margaret, so I was considered socially safe enough to be seated at her right hand at the dinner table. The next royal occasion I attended was during the visit of Her Majesty the Queen. It was the first ever visit of a British monarch to Los Angeles. The party was held in an enormous soundstage at 20th Century Fox Studios. The British Hollywood contingent was seated at a raised dais on either side of the Queen, and the rest of Hollywood society was seated below at tables laid out all over the studio floor. Also seated on the days were one or two Americans. Nancy Reagan was there, as was the multi-millionaire Cadillac dealer who had financed the evening. Because of his generosity, he got to sit next to the Queen, and I sat on the dais next to him. On the other side of the Queen sat the late Tony Richardson, the British director, whose credits included the film Tom Jones. The car dealer, sitting between the Queen and myself, seemed either paralysed with nerves or just plain tired, because he hardly moved or spoke during the entire evening. The Queen seemed OK when she was talking to Tony on her other side, but she was obviously finding it uphill work when the time came to talk to the other guy, until there was complete silence, I noticed, as Tony chatted to Nancy Reagan on his other side. Suddenly I heard a familiar voice. Mr. Kane? I looked around behind me. Nobody was there. Mr. Kane? Suddenly I saw the Queen's head appear round the car dealer. She was addressing me. I didn't know the Queen at all. I had just met her for the first time that evening in the line-up at the entrance. I peered round my side of the car dealer. Yes, Your Majesty, I blurted out, hoping that it was the correct form of address. Do you know any jokes, she said with a smile. Yes, ma'am, but very few that I could tell you, I replied. Have a go, she said, and then I will tell you one. I was amazed. The first two jokes I told her, she'd already heard. So I told her this one. The guy was driving a car along a country lane, quite fast, when suddenly a chicken with four legs overtook him. He looked into, was that a chicken with four legs? He speeded up and overtook the chicken and looked at it as he went by, and it was. It was a chicken with four legs. And suddenly the chicken got up to a hundred miles an hour and went tearing by down the country road, off into a side road, and into a farmyard. The driver of the car picked up speed, followed him, came skidding to a halt in the farmyard in front of a farmer who was standing there. He said to him, 
you just seen a chicken go tearing by here with four legs? So the farmer said, yes. He said, it's one of mine. He said, but it had four legs, didn't it? He said, yes. He said, they're special. He said, the restaurants around here like drumsticks. So I, I, I bred these special chickens with four legs. So the driver of the car said, what do they taste like? And the farmer said, I don't know. We've never caught one. That one made her laugh. So that is what we did for the rest of the evening. Swap jokes. I had always seen the Queen as a very serious figure, and it was a revelation to me that she had this funny side to her. For the first time I saw her laugh out loud. I was always pleased to get a laugh, but to get one from the Queen was a true accolade. Sally Field had just won an Oscar for Norma Ray, and I was offered a picture with her, but I turned it down in favour of educating Rita, playing opposite Julie Walters, who was making her cinema debut. The basic story is about a working-class girl who tries to better herself with education and her relationship with the professor who becomes her mentor. Both the film and the play were compared in tone at least to Shaw's Pygmalion, or as we now call it, My Fair Lady, with Rita as the Liza Doolittle figure and me as a sort of Professor Higgins. While there are elements of Pygmalion in it, and I could easily have taken that route, that is not what I base my role on at all. Higgins and Liza are both attractive people who wind up falling in love with each other, but I didn't see educating Rita in this way at all. I saw it with an under-theme of an ugly professor, he is an alcoholic in the story, who has an unrequited love for an attractive student, and I therefore based my performance not on Professor Higgins, but on Emil Janning's role as the professor who loves Marlena Dietrich in The Blue Angel. So I grew a beard and gained thirty pounds, so that there was no chance that Rita could possibly fancy me. We made the film at Trinity College in Dublin during the summer when all the students were on holiday. It was ideal for us, and Dublin is a favourite city of mine. I'd been there many years before with the play The Long and the Short and the Tour, but had never found the time to go back. It was a wonderful summer of work. The director, Lewis Gilbert, was still the warm, charming, shy man I remembered from Alfie and Julie Walters was smashing company. In the film, I played a professor of English, and on the first day of shooting, as we waited to do the very first shot, in fact, in the courtyard of the college, I spotted a familiar figure coming towards me. As he got closer, I realised that I did not know him. The reason he looked so familiar was because he mirrored the way that I looked. He was overweight and had a straggly beard, and his face was still flushed from last night's drinking. To top it all off, you can of red wine. I said to him, You wouldn't be a professor of English by any chance. He stopped and stared at me in amazement. As a matter of fact, I am. However did you know that? I smiled. Just a lucky guess. I had been in Hollywood now for five years and had made some tremendous friends and enjoyed a comfortable life. But I had left my country to start a new life at the age of forty-five which of course was too late. I had been very unhappy for some time now, and Shakira, being the incredible wife that she is, had seen what this was doing to me, and although she adored living there, for my sake she made a deal with me. The deal was this. We both agreed that my performance in educating Rita was the best I had ever given, possibly the best I would ever give. So if I didn't get an Oscar for that, there was no professional reason to continue living in the town and being unhappy doing it. The nominees were Albert Finney and Tom Courtney for The Dresser, Tom Conti for Reuben Reuben, and myself for Educating Rita. All four of us were British actors, and then there was one American actor, Robert Duval, who was nominated for a film called Tender Mercies. Robert won, I smiled and clapped, and the smile was really genuine but for another reason entirely. I was going home. From now on I had two preoccupations in my life. The first of these was to find a home in England. I knew exactly what I wanted. I wanted another house on the banks of the Thames, but farther away from London than my previous English home. My next proviso was that it had to be on a stretch of the river with the longest distance between two locks. I wanted to have a small boat, and I didn't want to have to go through a lock every time I went out on a trip. I also wanted direct frontage to the river. 
two more provisos. I wanted it to be in a village that was a cul-de-sac so that there was no passing traffic and one in which there was no pub or shop. In other words, no communal meeting place where the villagers could discuss the new owner of whatever house I bought. I knew that down the road lay gossip and curiosity and trouble. Shakira and I started the hunt in the summer of 1984 when I was filming in England. None of the houses that were for sale then in roughly the right area were suitable. So I decided to find a village that suited my requirements and then wait for a house to come up. Believe it or not, it worked. I found exactly what I wanted and bought it. It needed an enormous amount of work, but that was part of its attraction. My other preoccupation was to work. Mrs. Thatcher had reduced super tax to 50%, but even so my decision to return to England was an extravagance that had to be paid for. Apart from that consideration, I think I'm happiest when I'm working. I have been in over 73 films in 30 years. People often criticise me for not being discriminating enough and even for working so hard. Why bother? As far as discrimination is concerned, I have a definite standard by which I choose films. I choose the best one available at the time that I need one. Of course, this has often led me down dubious artistic paths, but even they are not without their advantages. It is much more difficult to act well in a bad film with a bad director than in any other type of movie, and it gives you great experience in taking care of yourself. It also means that when a good script does turn up, you're ready for it. It's not unlike athletes in training who will practice running on sand so that they find it easy to run on a solid track in competition. Plus, of course, there's the money. You get paid the same for a bad film as you do for a good one. I, of course, don't have the constraints of the great male Hollywood stars who will not play certain roles for fear of causing a lack of sympathy or letting down their fans. I cannot imagine a Robert Redford, Paul Newman or Clint Eastwood playing a transvestite killer as I did in Dress to Kill or an overt homosexual as I did in Death Trap. The main advantage that a foreign actor has in Hollywood is to play the flawed characters that the American stars don't want. The last three Best Actor Academy Awards have been won by British stars. Daniel Day-Lewis as a horribly deformed man in my left foot. Jeremy Irons as a man on trial for the alleged attempted murder of his wife in Reversal of Fortune. And Anthony Hopkins in 1992, who played Hannibal Lecter, the homicidal cannibal in The Silence of the Lambs. In November of 1984, I went to New York to film Hannah and Her Sisters, with Woody Allen as star, director and writer. I had always been a great admirer of Woody as a filmmaker and thought it was a great honour to be in one of his pictures. The producer obviously agreed with me as he offered me half my usual money, which I accepted. Being an actor himself, Woody is wonderful to work with. He understands the problems and is very tolerant of them, and he is a specialist in detail. One time I did a rehearsal and then a take, and he cut it and said, why didn't you do that movement with your hand like you did in the rehearsal? I had no idea what I'd done with my hand. And he showed me, and we shot it again with the movement in. He never missed a thing. When people hear that I've worked with Woody, they often think it must be a very amusing experience, but in fact the exact opposite is true. He likes to work in a very quiet atmosphere. It's a bit like working in church. People also think that he will say funny things all the time. Not so. Like all comedy writers, he doesn't say funny things. He listens to hear if you say something funny that he can use. His style of using a camera is very different from most directors as well. I was doing a scene where I had a lot of dialogue and I had to go from one room to another as I spoke. When we rehearsed, I noticed that the camera didn't follow me when I was speaking. And when I asked him why not, he told me that the camera was like his eye. And if he was looking at me as I was talking and I went into the other room still talking, he wouldn't get up and follow me there if he knew that I was going to come back. So the camera did the same thing. Woody's films consequently have such an air of reality that people often ask if you had lived most of the dialogue. Of course, the opposite is true. The dialogue, which is written by Woody, is carved in stone, unless you can come up with something on the spur of the moment that is much better than the material he has spent months perfecting, which is highly unlikely. In Hannah and Her Sisters, 
I play a man who is married to Mia Farrow, yet seduces her sister, played by that gifted actress and lovely woman, Barbara Hershey. Mia's mother in the film was played by her real mother, Maureen O'Sullivan, the first and most gorgeous Jane that I ever saw in a Tarzan movie. In the film, Mia and I have children, and these were played by her real children, and the flat that we lived in in the film was Mia's real apartment. One day, I wound up doing a love scene in bed with Mia in her own bedroom and being directed by her lover. This was nerve-wracking enough, but got even worse when I looked up during the rehearsal to find her ex-husband, Andre Previn, watching us from the other side of the bedroom. He had come to visit the children. Diane Wiest was also in the film. I had never heard of her, but I soon saw how good she was and was hence very surprised when Woody started to give her a tough time. This was unusual for him, I was told, but it paid off, because she wound up with an Oscar for the Best Supporting Actress. She wasn't the only Oscar winner on the film. I won as the Best Supporting Actor when the film came out later that year. They tell me, and who am I to argue, that winning an Oscar means that I've reached the top in my chosen profession. That gives me a good feeling. A very good feeling. We moved into the new house in England in the summer of 1987 and gave a party for Natasha's 14th birthday. My mother, who was 87, was invited. Mentally, she was not grasping situations quite as well as she had always done. I asked her what she thought of the place, and she said, Bloody awful. No curtains or pictures on the walls. You'd think with all this business they're doing, they'd do something about it. Surprised, I asked, What business? Well, look at all the customers, she replied, pointing at my guest. The worst pub I've ever been in. I realised that she didn't know this was my home and thought it was a pub. Are you short of money, was her next question. No, Ma, I said, what makes you think that? She pointed to Shakira, who was busy giving people drinks and collecting empty glasses. Why have you got Shakira working then? She asked accusingly. At Christmas... Our first Christmas back in England, in our own home, we went overboard to make it traditional. We put up a tree smothered in lights and decorated the walls with paper chains and holly and candles and all the rest of the paraphernalia that goes with Christmases in England. I kept telling myself that I was doing it for Natasha, but I was also doing it for the child in me who so long ago had missed so many Christmases. The company that day was small, just my family and Dennis Selinger, and a few waifs and strays, the people who have no family, and whom we invite to spend Christmas with us. We started with champagne and caviar, then came the turkey accompanied by Brussels sprouts, cocktail sausages, roast potatoes and rich turkey gravy. I'm getting hungry telling you all this. I haven't eaten all day. All this was washed down with 1959 Mouton Rothschild. Dessert was the usual Christmas pudding covered with either brandy butter or rich Devonshire cream. I can hear my cholesterol-conscious California friends panicking as they hear this bit. It's all right. You can't get it from listening. This part of the feast was lightly irrigated by Chateau Ikem, the world's greatest sweet dessert wine. All this was followed, if you haven't already been poleaxed into a deep slumber, by a portion of Stilton cheese accompanied by a couple of sticks of celery and a lip-smacking glass of 1945 port. On Boxing Day, we were invited to lunch by Mrs. Thatcher at Chequers, official country residence of British Prime Ministers. We'd only met her once, and that was only briefly, so the invitation was a bit of a surprise. It was an icy cold day and the roads were quite dangerous, so we were not looking forward to the long drive. My friend Lord Hanson, who I had known since he was playing James Hanson, came to the rescue. He dropped in at our home with his wife Geraldine in a helicopter and whisked us off to Chequers in ten minutes instead of what would have been an hour's drive. As we came down over the wide lawn in front of the house, policemen with shoved machine guns appeared all over the place and surrounded us. I was seated nearest the door and had to get out first and was immediately confronted by a policeman who recognised me. Looking at the helicopter, he said with a slightly disapproving air, I might have known it was you. I felt like saying, it's not mine, it's his, and blaming James for the extravagance, but I didn't. We all plodded up to the front door and rang the bell. 
I expected the door to be opened by a flunky in full costume, but instead Mrs. Thatcher herself opened it, all typical smiles and energy. Come along, ladies, she said in the manner of a teacher showing some new girls round the school. I'll show you the cloakroom. And in they went, leaving James and me standing there like lemons. Mrs. Thatcher looked back over her shoulder and shouted, You men can look after yourselves. This we did and went inside to the first reception room, which was crowded with people from all walks of life, many of whom I recognised. The first person I spoke to was a very pleasant, robust-looking lady, who turned out to be the captain of the English ladies' cricket team. She was rather aptly named Rachel Hayho Flint. The place was loaded with faces I'd seen in the Financial Times and a great many members of the government, but very few show business types. What impressed me most was the actual house itself. It seemed to be mostly Tudor or Elizabethan with high timbered ceilings, and it had been beautifully kept, absolutely immaculate. My recollection of whom I met that day is very dim. I had a hangover and the place was jammed with people. I do remember being seated at Mr. Thatcher's table at lunch. Shakira was with Mrs. Thatcher. I sat next to two marvellous people whom I did not recognise. They were a married couple and very funny. After a while I asked a man what he did for a living and he told me that he was the ex-chief rabbi of Britain. It was that sort of lunch and at our table there was a lot of laughter. The first course was a buffet and it was at this point that I spoke to Mrs. Thatcher for the only time at the lunch. Actually, she spoke to me. As I was leaving the table with my plate full, she was standing there sort of overseeing the operation. And as I went by, she said, Mr. Kane, you haven't got any caviar. You must have some, it's wonderful. Mr. Gorbachev gave it to me. I went and helped myself to a great spoonful of it and held it up to her as I passed. She smiled approvingly and said, So glad you came back. And that was it. I was officially welcomed home. On the 12th of December, 1989, my brother Stanley's birthday, our mother died. She'd eaten a hearty meal, smoked her cigarettes, finished a bottle of white wine and gone to bed happy and had died in her sleep. A great end, I thought, to a tough life. And she deserved to die without pain. The year ended badly for everyone, it seemed. The stock market had crashed in October, and a hurricane had scythed through the country. It seemed as if nothing would ever go right again. During the summer of 1990, I received my second invitation to dinner from Prime Minister Thatcher. I'd always thought of 10 Downing Street as a very modest terraced house, not really good enough for our Prime Minister. However, when you enter through the little front door, you suddenly find yourself in a great mansion with a magnificent staircase leading to a group of enormous reception rooms and a beautiful dining room that can seat at least 40 people. To this day, whenever I see 10 Downing Street on television, I still cannot understand how all those great rooms can be fitted in behind that tiny façade. Six months later, Shakira and I were invited to have another meal with Mrs. Thatcher. But this time, it was in very different circumstances. The occasion was Saturday lunch in the country house kitchen of some friends. Mrs. Thatcher had just been ousted as Prime Minister two weeks before, and we were all fascinated to see how she had taken this terrible blow. At first sight, she seemed to be the same tough, uncompromising Maggie, but as the lunch progressed, it became apparent that it had been a terrible trauma for her. 1991 started out with the Gulf War. Interest rates were high and the bottom had dropped out of the property market. To cheer ourselves up, at least once a week we would go up to London and go out to the theatre. As we made our way along the Strand, I became terribly aware that something, apart from the recession that we were now in, had gone dreadfully wrong. Every doorway along this once fashionable street was filled with cardboard boxes containing homeless children some even younger than my daughter, sleeping rough. When I had left this country twelve years before, it had been in a state of chaos, populated by tired, directionless people, and I had great admiration for Mrs. Thatcher, who had come along and proceeded to galvanise everyone with aspirations and a sense of purpose. But I began to comprehend that she had made a big mistake. 
one which had eventually caught up with her. She had got the people of my country up off their asses and onto their feet, but she had forgotten about those who had only made it to their knees. Relief from my depression came in the form of an offer that I could not refuse. Peter Bogdanovich phoned to ask if I would play the director in the movie version of Noises Off. Farce is a difficult medium, even in the theatre. In film, it is almost impossible. And so it proved for us, at least from the American reception of the film. It is not yet opened in England, so there's still hope. We took the opportunity, while in Los Angeles, to look for a small Beverly Hills home, and found one almost immediately. Everything seemed perfect. Natasha received the wonderful news that she got into university, the first person in my family ever to achieve this. There was, however, a sting in the tail. There usually is. One Friday evening, during the shooting of the film, I reached home from work just as the phone was ringing. I rushed in and picked it up and discovered the legacy that my mother had left me. I was shocked when the reporter from the English tabloid, The People, gave me the news that I had an illegitimate half-brother. His name was David. He had been born with epilepsy, which in 1924 was not medically as easily treated as today. From a social point of view, it was very easily treated as a form of insanity. When he grew to adulthood, he was automatically put into a fully-fledged lunatic asylum, where he spent the next fifty years. I didn't know what to expect, but what I found as I opened the door and saw him for the first time stunned me. I had no idea of the severity of his condition. The most extraordinary information I was given, however, was the fact that for sixty-two years of his life, with the exception of the Second World War and her time with us in Beverly Hills, my mother had visited him every Monday without my late father or my brother Stanley or me ever knowing anything about it. The name of the asylum where David was kept was Cane Hill. I will always wonder what my mother must have thought on the day I told her that I was going to call myself Michael Kane. She was an incredible woman, but she is still surprising me, even from the grave. My discovery of David had forced me to reassess myself. It's funny about things like that. There are secrets so close to you that they can alter the very foundation on which you have built your life. So, 1992 has begun, and this is where I stop. This is not the end of it, but I suppose that at the end of an autobiography I should be winding up my life for you. I can't do that. The first 29 years of my life were rough, and the last 29 have been great. So now, at the age of 59, I'm not only even, but ahead for the first time in my life. My half-brother David died a couple of months ago, and his ashes are buried with our mothers in my garden. My brother Stanley is living far away in Cornwall. Dominique is happily married and living on her own farm in Gloucestershire. And Natasha is away at university. So Shakira and I are now alone again, in a sense, as happy as we have ever been. So what was it all about? In my case, it was about ambition and anger and despair and determination. The everyday driving force of the poor who wish to find a ladder out of the well of hopelessness. It was also about my companions on my journey through show business. We are not, of course, without our faults. For the most part, we are spoiled if we are successful and bitter if we are not. We can be conceited and arrogant. And we are all without exception, insecure. Finally, we are all slightly mad, or we would not be in this business in the first place, and only cling on to some sanity by a thin thread of incurable optimism. Most of all, my fellow travellers have been fun to be with, and most of the time, a joy to work with. And to all of you who have come this far with me, a special thanks for allowing my story into yours for a little while. God bless and good luck. Just for the record, that's what it was all about.